Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order the June meeting of the UW Board of Regents. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Regent Drew Peterson. Here. Regent Atwell. Here. Regent Bechtel. Here. Regent Delgado. Here. Regent Grebe. Here. Regent Hall. Here. Regent Jones. Here. Regent Klein. Here. Regent Benny Deeds. Regent Mueller. Here. Regent Chris Peterson. Here. Regent Plant. Regent Stanford Taylor. Here. Regent Tiedemann. Here. Regent Tyler. Here. Regent Walsh. Here. Regent Whitburn. Here. Regent Woodmancy. Here. We have a one. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, before we consider items on today's agenda, are there board members who wish to declare any conflicts of interest regarding the open session agenda today? Hearing none, let's proceed with the agenda. Welcome everyone to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and thank you Chancellor Mone and your team for your high, fine hospitality. Our annual visit to UW-Milwaukee always includes exciting new ideas, innovations, and activities happening on campus. We look forward to hearing and seeing more about these developments while we're here. Before we get started, it's my pleasure to introduce several new members recently appointed to our board. We anticipate their confirmation hearings will be held soon. First, Karen Walsh. Karen is director of the Burby Walsh Foundation, a family foundation dedicated to human and animal health and welfare. Since 2006, the foundation has awarded more than $8 million in grants in the state of Wisconsin. His generosity includes gifts to the University of Wisconsin hospitals and clinics that created the Burby Walsh Department of Emergency Medicine. Karen previously was a reporter for news outlets, including Wisconsin Public Radio, before serving in a variety of public information and communications positions at UW-Madison over the span of two decades. She retired in 2005, she looks well too young to do that, uh, as Assistant Dean for External Relations in the College of Engineering. She's a native of Columbus, Wisconsin, and Karen holds bachelor's and master's degrees in journalism from UW-Madison. She serves on a number of nonprofit boards, including the Board of Visitors at the UW-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine, the Madison Cat Project, and the Access Community Health Center's Partners Board. She's also a past president of the Madison Opera Board of Trustees. She and her husband, Dr. James Burby, live in Madison. Welcome to the Board of Regents, Karen. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to thank all of you on the board and working at the system. Uh, the chancellors have all been so kind to me and made me feel so welcome. Um, unfortunately, you've probably noticed that I do not have my radio voice with me today. Um, it is allergy season for us Wisconsin girls. I, I did want to take a minute or two to let you know a little bit about me and where I come from. Uh, Drew mentioned that I grew up in Columbus, Wisconsin. For those of you who don't know, that's a town of about 5,000 people. And uh, I lived in a rural part of the town. Uh, and neither of my parents went to college. In fact, my mother is a first generation American. And uh, my dad would have preferred to stay a farmer. Uh, he felt he couldn't send three kids to college reliably on a farmer's income. He made a, a Hobson's choice and took a job in Madison at Oscar Meyer, driving twice a day from Columbus to Madison, which I can tell you is not fun. And I, I don't think he really enjoyed it, quite frankly. But um, that was very important to my parents to make sure that all three of us had a college education. And I can say that the proudest I ever saw my father look was when I walked across the stage and accepted my master's degree from John Wiley. I think he wasn't quite sure that that was his little girl up there taking a degree from the chancellor. So I want you all to know that when I think of the students that attend uh, college in the UW system, I think of not only, of course, the urban students, but I think of those rural students from small towns because those students are me. Um, and so I'm very excited to work with all of you. Thanks again for making me feel so welcome. Thanks to Governor Evers for his confidence in me. I, I won't let him down or you down. I appreciate it. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work. Regent Walsh, welcome to the board. <laughs> the 
Next, I'm delighted to welcome Olivia Woodbenese, who is joining us to serve as a student regent. Olivia is currently a student at UW La Crosse, pursuing a degree in English. Originally from New Glarus, Olivia just completed her sophomore year. She's been very active in student government at UWL, serving the past two years as a member of the Segregated Uni University Fee Allocation Committee, including serving time as chair. Looking ahead, Olivia plans to go to law school, hopefully at UW-Madison. Welcome aboard, Olivia. Would you like to say a few words? I'd love to. I'd first like to start off by thanking everyone once again for their hospitality and for being so welcome to me. Not only all of the regions, but all the chancellors and everyone at the universities. It's really been a pleasure and quite an honor to be here. I'm so humbled by this experience already and I can tell already how much I'm going to learn from it and how amazing this is going to be for me and hopefully for all of the students at the UW institutions. I'm really looking forward to serving all of the students primarily, but then also all of the faculty members really listening. That's my key goal in this is just to make sure I'm listening, making sure I'm taking in as much information as I can and serving this board as proudly as I can. Thank you all so much. third new member had a, pr a prior spe scheduling conflict and could not join us, but he's a f familiar face to this board and the state of Wisconsin, and that's Ed Manydeeds. Ed is an Eau Claire attorney and a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. This is his second term or tour of duty on this board. Ed previously served a seven-year term that concluded in 2017. We look forward to working with Ed again, and we'll share more about him at our next meeting. So welcome to our new colleagues. I know I speak for all members of the board in saying we look forward to working with you and getting to know you better in the time ahead. I believe President Cross, you also have some introductions to make. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Before I make introductions, I would like to make sure that uh, we recognize and remember the importance of this day in the history of our nation, D-Day. 75 years ago, the largest armada of ships in the world, in the history of the world, carried out many of our family members and our descendants, we're descendants of, across the English Channel to secure freedom for us. And in doing so, we owe to them a great debt of gratitude. So I wanted to make sure we remembered that. After a search chaired by Regent Tracy Klein, UW Whitewater has a new chancellor, Dwight Watson. Dwight Watson is currently the Provost and Vice President of Academic and Student Affairs at Southwest Minnesota State University. He will start on August 1st. At this time, I would like to thank Interim Chancellor Cheryl Green for stepping up to lead the UW Whitewater campus. So Cheryl, would you just stand up and give your round of applause here? So. helped the Whitewater students, faculty, and staff during an important time of transition. Uh, she will soon be resuming her previous position as Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at Oshkosh, and I know the Oshkosh campus is eager for your return. So thank you, Cheryl. We look forward to working with you more in the future. I'm also pleased to introduce the new Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance at UW-Superior, Jeffrey Collar. Uh, Kaylor Jeffrey, uh, I think he's there, he's standing up out there, so. Jeffrey is a lifelong Superior resident. He earned both his Bachelor's of Science in Accounting and a Master's of Business Administration at UW-Superior. He has worked on campus since 2005, most recently as the Administrative Officer in the Budget Office. Jeffrey says he's excited to be able to come to help the campus in this new role so that other people can have the opportunity to experience the same benefits um, of UW Superior that he has experienced. So welcome, Jeffrey. We look forward to working with you. It's also my pleasure to welcome an old, 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 old friend. <laughs> um, did I mention that he was old? I just need to mention that. Um, Jim Henderson, back to the UW system. <laughs> 
Jim is serving as interim provost at UW-Madison. Jim retired last year from the UW system where he served as vice president for academic and student affairs. His current interim appointment will bridge the gap between former Madison provost Sarah Magelsdorf and the new provost Carl Schultz. We, formally, we will formally introduce um, Carl when he is, uh, who is currently dean of UW-Madison's College of Letters and Science at a future meeting. In the meantime, Welcome back, old friend, okay? I have harassed him one too many times, I can tell. So. <laughs> Finally, we'd like to extend our thanks to Greg Davis, who recently announced that he has decided to step down as provost at UW-Green Bay to rejoin the mathematics faculty at UWGB's College of Science, Engineering, and Technology starting this fall. So we appreciate your service, Greg, and appreciate all you've done. So we wish you the best as you return to teaching. Back to you, Vice President Peters. Well, a warm welcome to all of our new colleagues. I know we certainly look forward to your future contributions to the UW system and working with you in the coming academic year. The theme of this month's meeting is UW System, Meeting the Needs of Wisconsin. President Clark Cross would like to set the stage and say a few words, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. In the past couple of weeks, uh, I've experienced some ups and some downs, but mostly missed opportunities, as uh, most of you know. Our commitment to advocating for the UW System is un wavering, unwavering. It's just too important. The UW system is invaluable to this state and we must not be passive when it is so clear that no one else, no other entity can do what we can do to help our state and our economy. In every region of the state I visit, I hear from employers and community leaders who are screaming for talent. Come on, Ray. The UW system is the answer. We develop the talent in Wisconsin. We attract the talent to Wisconsin. We are Wisconsin's talent magnet. Ideas and intellectual property spawned in the UW system are translated into entrepreneurial enterprises from small businesses that keep the economy humming to multi-million billion dollar operations. If you envision a future with a dynamic, healthy economy, the UW system is in the middle of that future. Now, more than ever, we all need to remember what the UW system offers and delivers to the people of Wisconsin. In every community in the state, from Superior to Racine, from Platteville to Marinette, from, from the Mississippi to Lake Michigan, we are invaluable to this state. And that's why our operating budget request was reasonable and reflects our commitment to Wisconsin. That commitment to our students, faculty and staff, and to the citizens of this state will not change. For that reason, we will continue to relentlessly work to convince legislators, business leaders, community members, and others of the importance to all of us of investing in the UW. Our capital budget request provides another opportunity. If we are to attract, to develop, and to retain the world-class talent West Wisconsin desperately needs, we need world-class classrooms and added STEM capacity. We will continue to advocate for our capital projects as well as our operating budget because quite simply, the cost to the people of Wisconsin of not doing so is just too high. <clears throat> we are focused on repairing and renovating buildings, the cornerstone of our capital request because that will allow our universities to continue to ensure a safe and productive environment for our students, faculty, and staff. And that benefits the kid enter, entering kindergarten in La Crosse, the parent returning to school in Green Bay, the worker on the assembly line in Racine, 
or the engineering student at Platteville. They are depending on us, and we cannot let them down. Vice President Peterson. Thank you, Ray. Let me take a second to underscore that central message and to add some emphasis. The University of Wisconsin is indeed an invaluable asset. It's vitally important to this state. The UW system deserves and has in earned an infusion of investment. The returns have been calculated. They're significant. They're significant and they benefit us all. As a board, I believe we must remain tenacious advocates for the UW system. If we're going to build on the momentum that we have generated for the last several years, stalling progress is a risk Wisconsin cannot afford. And now is the time for continued action. And with that, we're going to move on to our first presentation this afternoon. One of the best parts about our taking the Regent Show on the road is the opportunity it gives us to learn more about the great campuses that make up the UW system and how each of them, in their own unique way, is meeting the needs of the state. Here to share UW-Milwaukee's story is our host, Chancellor Mark Money. Good afternoon. Thank you, Regent Vice President Peterson, President Cross. You could not have set the stage better for some of the things that I am happy to share with you this afternoon. And I would say right out of the gate that what you're going to hear from UW-Milwaukee is simply representative of what all of my colleague chancellors would present and um, what everybody in this room stands for in terms of delivering what Wisconsin needs. So uh, thank you for this opportunity, uh, Board of Regents. Wonderful to have you here in Milwaukee. And I'm pleased to be able to, to um, share with you how we, in fact, uh, meet Wisconsin's needs in the unique context that we do. The structure that I'll use, I always like to provide an overview, um, is to talk about, first of all, Milwaukee's background and unique role. Um, many of you know several of these things about Milwaukee, but I hope that uh, there will be some unique insights with respect to how we meet them. We'll talk about, since we last met, our highlights and progress, some of the momentum underway. Specifically, the heart of the talk is around how we are addressing several of the needs, not all of them, uh, but certainly some that we think are quite acute. And then last, we'll wrap up with an argument for investing, uh, continuing to invest, and, and make further investments in UW-Milwaukee, as well as um, UW system continuing in that way. UW-Milwaukee today. This snapshot is descriptive, and the number one at the top describes there's only one in the state. There's only one public urban research university. I'd like to break that down just a little bit. Milwaukee is large. It's diverse. We have, from an economic driver perspective, many people would often say, how Milwaukee goes, so goes the state of Wisconsin. I'd like to reinforce that in one of my closing comments, not quite done yet, but one of my closing comments <laughs> will be on that exact theme. That as Milwaukee has grown and developed, it's in part because UW-Milwaukee has grown and developed. And I would argue that there's a tripart relationship that the state absolutely benefits from the, the uh, uh, relationship, the symbiosis, if you will, between UWM and Milwaukee and the larger state. And I'll make that case in a number of different ways uh, today. So that's what the number one is about. It's about research and partnerships, and it's about filling the talent pipeline and providing access. And I'm going to talk an awful lot today about that particular issue using an equity and diversity lens throughout uh, a number of my comments and examples. We have across our three campuses 27,444 students. Um, this is something that, that uh, we think is vitally important, and I'm going to continue to talk about those linkages through the talk. 83% of our students are from Wisconsin, and um, the 17% that are from out of state and international are um, roughly 40% of those students that are out of, out of um, Wisconsin are international. About 60% are uh, from uh, other states. 37% first generation, and I think you can appreciate what that means in terms of um, the the differences when you haven't prepared, you haven't had family mentors, you haven't built savings, it's a, it's a different type of background. Being a first generation student myself, I can completely appreciate that. 
I want to point out, when we talk about diversity, I was on a panel yesterday dealing with, it was an HPGM, what we call Hispanic Professionals in Greater Milwaukee, and they're tracking um, how the, the population of Hispanic uh, individuals in this state is growing, but the actual income is not, and opportunities are not, and we were talking about that on this panel. And what I pointed out in that panel is that 61% of UW-Milwaukee's Hispanic students are first generation. So think about how much more um, the issues are when we talk about lack of savings, lack of role models, lack of some of the, the preparation when you have uh, diverse populations. Um, in terms of students of color, undergraduate, 35%. Um, and this is an interesting statistic, 5,300 students, and that number has remained pretty constant over the last decade. So if you think about that, the numbers of individuals who have stayed in this state and contribute to the talent pipeline is significant. And the other thing that wraps that up is the bottom line on this slide, where we have almost 190,000 alumni, over 75% of whom stay in Wisconsin. But that reflects retirees who, for some reason, don't always stay in Wisconsin. I can't quite figure that one out, but um, what we have done is tracked for the first decade and we know that that number of alumni who stay in Wisconsin is actually 85%. So that's a really important statistic from a talent pipeline perspective in light of what President Cross and Vice President um, uh, Peterson have talked about. In terms of some unique things about UW-Milwaukee, we have uh, 850 online classes, which is the largest number, as well as the largest number of online students in the state of Wisconsin, over 10,000 or approaching 10,000. We have today, um, been recognized in the U.S. News and World Report for the master's level. We're in the top 16 percent. For the doctorate of nursing practice, we're in the top 11 percent. We're also the largest nursing program in the state of Wisconsin. We have uh, more veterans at 1,000 than any other two- or four-year institution in the state of Wisconsin, and we have more than any campus in a six-state surrounding region. Very important, and um, it's something that I'll refer to later in terms of some of the work that we do. We have the only school of freshwater sciences, and I'm not going to talk at length about that because we're going to have another presentation after this one around our freshwater collaborative, of which um, several of our leaders, um, not only at UWM, but across the system, are uh, working to develop something that's unique and unprecedented in the history of Wisconsin, and that is how UW system is working on the 10 grand water challenges. But, but uh, we are happy to take a key role in that. The final uh, unique thing about UWM, and these are just a few of the many, is our school of, um, in the Peck School of the Arts, where we have a top 20 film program, which was recognized again this year as top 20. Why that's significant is that um, Milwaukee Film Alliance, about two years ago, did a study. And this surprised me, having been here for some time, knowing the importance of brewing to the state of Wisconsin, in particular southeastern Wisconsin. The employment today in the film industry in the metro Milwaukee region is five times that of the brewing and distribution. Think about that for a moment. Five times as many people employed in film. It's pretty remarkable across a number of different things. In fact, the rate of growth of employment in film is twice as high as the average employment growth rate in this region. The heart of it is our film program. The heart of it is the graduates who have gone out. For example, Milwaukee Film Festival. Milwaukee Film, of which Regent Tracy Klein has been a longtime supporter, chair, and, and strong leader, um, will tell you that we have moved up into one of the top film festivals in the country. One of our alumni, Jonathan Jackson, is the, is the executive director and the star of, of that. That's just one example. There's many, many others. But that's just one example of, of the, uh, the impact and the types of things that our graduates do. Positive progress, real quickly. Many of you were here to celebrate. Thank you for joining us as we were redesignated as a Research One University this year. Originally, uh, we recognized that and were recognized as that by the Carnegie Institute in 2016. Uh, we've continued to do that. And this really speaks to the quality of the faculty at UWM, the perseverance, the dedication, and the deliberate intention that we have toward maintaining research in addition to access, which is, again, that unique part of UW-Milwaukee. We were one of two campuses to receive this award, the uh, recognition for being uh, uh, focusing and having outstanding programs in undergraduate research. One of our students went to the White House, one of 50 students, to be able to talk uh, at the White House about uh, their research. Pretty remarkable. We celebrated this year 50 years of black and diaspora studies uh, at UW-Milwaukee. We had uh, Regent, I'm sorry, we had um, 
The distinguished professor, Evelyn Higginbotham from Harvard University, who is the chair of history, distinguished professor, who came and gave a keynote address at this. She had received in 2014 her honorary doctorate from UWM. She was a 1969 graduate, one of the uh, remarkably uh, prominent historians in the country, and it's wonderful to have Dr. Higginbotham on uh, campus. We celebrated this year the 10th anniversary of the Zilber School of Public Health. I'll talk about the Zilber School in a number of different areas, but this is important because it's the only freestanding accredited school of public health in the state of Wisconsin serving the needs of a remarkably important urban community. Our campaign, I'm happy to report, uh, we received official word earlier this week that we passed $230 million um, for, for a, a campaign that had had a, an initial goal. We haven't quite finished yet. Our initial goal was 175. We raised it to 200, passed through that, and today we're at 230. To put this in perspective, our previous campaign was at about $125 million in terms of what it came in as. So it's substantial, and this bodes very well for, for our endowment, future scholarships, research, and engagement in the community. Finally, um, we continue to be recognized in the top LGBT-friendly campuses. And when we talk about this award, it's not the top 25 or 40 percent. It's literally the top 30 in the nation. It's one of our strengths. And again, it's about intentionality. These things don't happen by accident. They are very deliberate and focused. Now, the heart of the talk. Thank you, President Cross. Thank you, Vice President Peterson, for setting the stage so well. This is perfectly teeing up what I'd like to share with you. Um, there's four major areas that I'll talk about, and they are represented here. I'm sorry, I hit that microphone in practice a couple times, too. Um, gesture a little too much. Um, so you can see the four. I'll go through them. I won't read them. But I'm going to use a format where I'm going to talk about some of the needs and then talk about some of the solutions. And then I'm going to follow each one with an example of a student who brings it to life. One area that we all know across dozens of different health needs that we have in the state and frankly the nation, there's two in particular that I'll focus on. Opioids is one. We all have friends, family members, know of individuals who have been affected by this crisis. There was an article, it was like earlier this week in the Journal Sentinel, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and it talks about how opioids are even now affecting trees. It must be in the water. I didn't read the article, um, but it must be environmental. You know, the toxins and things like that. Our colleagues in the School of Freshwater Science, I'm sure, could tell me uh, much more about this. Um, but we know the issues are significant. We know they're real and, and need to be addressed. We also know that asthma affects 25 million Americans. And it's all too personal. It's all too close. Um, and I'll, I'll hold off on stories if you um, uh, give me the right adult beverage tonight and tell you more of those. But I can tell you this is significant. And uh, we've sought out to address both of these areas. In one, well, more broadly, let me just first of all mention one of the keys to this. We have a partnership in this region. It's called the Clinical, Transliance, Clinical Translation Science Institute. We have, with the Medical College of Wisconsin alone, 50 of our faculty that have joint appointments with the Medical College, and between 100 and 150 people at the Medical College in terms of faculty who have joint appointments at UWM in different ways. Marquette University, Milwaukee School of Engineering, and Concordia are also involved in this. It's something that we have been uh, receiving funding for for almost a decade now, and it underlies the premise of when we talk about translational, it takes scientific discoveries and applications in the lab to the bedside. So that's the translation. Take it out of the lab into bedside, into patient care. So that's the heart of much of this. One of the things that we're doing in the asthma side of things is developing a drug that frees up individuals from the incorrect use of inhalers or the fact that you'd need inhalers at all. And if you know anybody with asthma, it's oftentimes many times a day, and it's a very concerning type of disease to have. But if you can take a pill once or twice a week, that addresses this, it's substantial in terms of what it means from a treatment perspective and longevity, number of important things. So we've been working with our faculty, have been working with uh, faculty at Columbia University and re received a startup grant um, because they've discovered a new drug called MIDD0331, which I'll explain at some other time, again, if you're interested. But it's very important as a new pathway for treatment. On the opioid side, we know that there's victims of opioids that are beyond the actual victim, but the secondary uh, victim oftentimes includes family members. So our researchers in this particular study are looking at family members. They're interviewing a very sensitive audience, the kids, 
and in particular the dependence of individuals who have been in opioid abuse or opioid overdose situations. And they've been involved with better ways of training kids who are going to oftentimes be, when mom or dad, big brother, big sister, have an opioid crisis, they're going to be the ones that are going to oftentimes have to administer the Narcan. That's a very important, very, very, um, you know, high risk type of, of uh, situation. So behavioral issues, family issues, that's just one aspect of some of the things that we're looking at. So one of the things that, that um, when we talk about health, we know across the state when you array the occupational needs in, in the state, we know that nursing is, if not at the top, depending on where you are in the state, it is substantial. We anticipate that in the next couple of years, and very quickly next couple of years, we're going to be 9,000 nurses short. I was with Kathy Jacobson, the president of Freighter Health yesterday, and she was telling me that they have hired since September of last year 590 nurses, and they could use that many more. And you talk to any healthcare provider, and that's exactly the state that we're in. Southeastern Wisconsin next year, seven counties will need 2,500 additional nurses. We need to fill this pipeline. It's significant. I'm telling you that from the perspective of the largest nursing program, and we cannot uh, do more. That's another topic for further discussion. But I'd like to show you a story of one student who's helping. I received my letter of acceptance to the nursing program, and a few weeks later found out that I was pregnant. So I had my daughter, and they actually brought in a camera into the class. I could log in virtually, and I could watch my lectures while breastfeeding Marilyn. I could watch my my lectures while changing a poopy diaper and then there was an instructor that actually let me bring Marilyn to class. They really listened to the type of learner that I was and tried their best to figure out a way to make it work. I was blessed to be considered for a Shanghai International Nursing Skills Competition and we ended up placing first place. I never in a million years could have imagined ending up going to Shanghai and you know winning first place for a nursing skills competition. I have decided that I will be continuing on with UW-Milwaukee and become a doctorate of nurse practitioner. I'm sure that I will cry at graduation just thinking that I remember watching my mom walk across the stage and how inspiring that was to me. I am so excited to be able to show that to my daughters and I hope that I can continue to be that role model and just to prove to them that if you have a dream, there is a way to accomplish it. All right, great. So this is an example of uh, one of the non-traditional students that UW-Milwaukee excels at serving. And frankly, almost 40% of our students are non-traditional. And what that means is that they're outside the traditional age range of 18 to 22. That's also one of the reasons why our students have such remarkable success in the workplace, because they've worked typically before they graduate. So they've got a work ethic that, that uh, is remarkable. So that's one of the needs, health. Um, the second one I'm going to talk about is around entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is something that we continue to have a chronic issue around. Um, the, the Kaufman Index, the most recent report that came out, I believe it was in April of this year, um, reported, I'm sorry, February of this year, they have an index across the, across the bottom, you see the four cells, the four on the left of the five. And the, the, on the right-hand side in the gray, you see the early stage entrepreneurship or Casey index. That's the composite across these four categories. If you can't rate it, it's rate of new entrepreneurs, opportunity share, startup early job creation, and startup early survival rate. This state ranks 46th out of 50. In the box startup early job creation, number one, the, 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 the box in the middle, we're 50th out of 50 states. This is for data from 2015 to 2017. So it's over that three-year period. That's the most recent data for which there's a three-year window. This is appalling. This is concerning. If we think about these are the investments that are the future from a growth and opportunity for individuals, knowing how many other states find that this is where there's the most job creation is around small and entrepreneurial firms. So what are we doing about it? We have opened recently, last month, the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center and Welcome Center. I hope you can join us at the uh, reception that we're going to have tonight and, and uh, see some of the types of activities that we're doing, take a tour, learn more about the programs that are there. Let's talk about some of the outcomes and the activities. I'll start on the left-hand side of this column with one activity. It's around our student engagement, the types of things that we do in the LEC or Lubar Entrepreneurship Center. We've had over 6,500 different types of engagements in the last three years. Without the building open, 
wait till we open the building and see what we can do then. This is distributed in a lot of different areas. We have um, engaged since 2012 with a student startup challenge, and we've had 100 teams, and they represent 168 participants since 2012. The important point about this is the types of add-on companies and the types of funds raised, which I'll talk about uh, next. NSF has a program that started at Stanford. We've sent a lot of faculty and students to Stanford. They're called Innovation Fellows, and they get trained and they come back, and we're the hub. So we work with four other universities in the region, and we have um, these clusters of faculty, students in particular, and community mentors. At any given time, there's 80 to 100 mentors in this program alone. They have had $4 million in startup funding, and we have 22 going concerns as a result of NSF. i -Core, Innovation Core, is what this uh, stands for. Fresh ideas, you can appreciate. This is when we engage with freshmen. So what we want to do is have opportunities, not as juniors and seniors, not as grad students, but start early, start young, get this idea inculcated as you're a student at UWM. That's why we combine the Entrepreneurship Center with the Welcome Center to put that brand on UW-Milwaukee as an entrepreneurial, innovative university. This is an example. Per, per, since we've started this since 2016, 3,400 student engagements. This is in pop-up classes. This is in all types of interactions exposing students to the wonderful opportunities of entrepreneurship. The final area is our partnership with ScaleUp. ScaleUp Milwaukee focuses on companies that are a million dollars on average and sometimes slightly above because these are successful firms that have made that launch. They've gotten through all the initial funding, the initial the, the, the obstacles that you have as a startup. So they're running a payroll today. Um, they're at a million dollars in revenue. And we take these companies, the goal is to, to give them the skills in a composite way, some of the standard classical business skills that you oftentimes don't have as an inventor, as an innovator, as an entrepreneur in the beginning. We've had 71 companies graduate, and by the way, we host that program now in the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center. It's moving in there. We had been delivering this program in the Zilber School of Public Health, and it's our faculty who deliver this program. 71 companies have graduated, 23% revenue growth, 800 new employees for these firms since that time. That's the type of growth that we need to spur and, and uh, continue to reinforce. So again, needs with solutions. So I'd like to share with you now a story. Uh, James Van Erden is on the right. Matt Kemper is his business partner on the left. And I'd like to talk a little bit about their story. Um, they're also uh, recent graduates. The summer of 2016, I had the idea to dehydrate watermelon, and it actually tasted pretty good. And I came to UWM, and I found the Student Startup Challenge, and they helped nurture the idea into Light Fruit Company. The Student Startup Challenge was able to give me a small grant to get my first four dehydrators and some packaging. But even more important is the knowledge that I've learned through events sponsored by UWM. We had the opportunity to meet with food and beverage startups and manufacturers throughout the Milwaukee area, really accelerating the business. Over the next year, Matt and I were able to compete in and win seven different business plan competitions. We were able to get a, a TV spot on Project Pitch It. It's a local version of Shark Tank, and we were awarded $10,000 on that TV show. This summer, we're gonna be working hard at launching our production facility, so we'll begin manufacturing and packaging and shipping our product. I love my time at UWM, and I'm excited to apply everything that I've learned thus far and see where it gets me. Great. So in the interest of time, I'm going to not tell you the story right now about another successful entrepreneur. Um, her product is in the bag in front of you, if you are uh, at one of the tables here, where Indulgence Chocolate is uh, one of our very su uh, successful student entrepreneurs. Fascinating story behind that, um, and perhaps at the end, if you're interested, I can tell you more. The third issue um, that we know about is one of the more prominent issues in the state of Wisconsin is around education. This morning, in the Education Committee, we had a presentation that the Regents have um, uh, been, been um, very focused on around the teacher pipeline. We have some activities and aspects at UW-Milwaukee, like many schools of education across the state, in terms of growing that talent pipeline. But I'm going to talk about something different. I'm going to talk about the achievement gap. I'm going to talk about one of the most significant issues, not just in urban areas, but frankly across the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin occupies the most unfortunate position in terms of the black-white achievement gap in high school. We are 50th out of 50. And that gap continues in college. 
And I can tell you on the Hispanic versus white, we are number 43 out of 50. Neither of these numbers is acceptable, and we have to do something about it. This is not just Milwaukee. This is across the state of Wisconsin. The statistics that I'm going to share with you now, if you haven't heard these before, are going to be compelling. And they'll make you wonder why, and they'll hopefully motivate you to have the same angst that we have at UW-Milwaukee. These numbers are very concerning. In a freshman class in Milwaukee, and I'm talking now about the larger metro Milwaukee area, not just the city of Milwaukee, and frankly, these numbers don't change a whole lot across the state, and I can show you additional graphs and numbers. 20 high school freshmen start, about 13 of those are going to graduate from high school. And you know what? Within six years, only two of those students will graduate from college, two or four year. Think about that. What does that mean for that individual, the, the individuals we're leaving behind? What does that mean for their families? And what does that mean for employers and society? I said unacceptable. We have to do better. And I have made a commitment, and this campus has made a significant commitment as an access university to do something about it. What are we doing about it? Let's talk specifically in some of the headway, some of the progress that we're making. You've heard me talk before, and I've had Superintendent Driver and President Martin from MATC and uh, MPS. Today, Superintendent Driver has uh, moved on, and we have Superintendent Posley. Both of those individuals are Panthers, by the way. We're very proud of, of uh, their UWM work. We have uh, done a lot of things that, that have um, delivered on helping close this gap. One of the things that we know with the premise of M-cubed, which is to transform the region through education, is a number of specific activities. So some of the outcomes include the improved transfers across our institutions through better aligned coursework and curriculum. We've had a number of summer bridge programs that increase the number of students that go from high school on to college. We have students that are getting credit-bearing math courses at MATC and UWM at rates that we've never seen before. So let's talk about some of the specific outcomes, and there's an extensive dashboard that I could show you. On the far right-hand side, one of the things that is, well, let's start with the box at the bottom. One of the most important things that often regents and others ask me about is, yeah, do more students graduate? Let's keep the focus on that. Take a look at that box. In the history of MPS, I think you have to go back at least to the 1930s to see the types of numbers that we're seeing today in terms of graduation rates. In other words, this number has been intractable. It has been very difficult to move beyond 60%. Today, we're at almost 67%, and I anticipate that we will be by next year high 60s, if not breaking that 70%. That's phenomenal because it means that many fewer generations, that many fewer individuals left behind. The FAFSA rate, we're one of the leading urban areas in the country today in terms of FAFSA completion. And you know if you don't complete the FAFSA, you are not going to college for most students in this region. It's a pathway. It's the opening of the door. We can talk about some other important statistics in terms of some of the things that are happening, and it's, it's uh, very compelling. But one of the things that I also need to point out, as impatient and as urgent as we are, we know this takes time. We know that oftentimes high school students enter ninth grade, and I'm talking not just MPS, Milwaukee Public Schools, I'm talking in a lot of choice and charter schools, and I say this with experience. We have 14 charter schools. We know the data. I can tell you that many students enter high school, and they are three years behind at that point. They're three years behind in math and reading. You cannot make that up that quickly. So there's significant issues that, that we are facing, and it takes a long time. The lower left, what I just clicked on, is a quick story I want to tell you about a program where we had the first graduation last week. It's the result of our M-cubed work. It's called the Early College Program. We started this program last year. In one semester, students come to MATC four days a week after school, and then they come to UWM toward the end of the week. They get seven credits at Milwaukee Area Technical College in math and English, and then we give them an educational psychology course. All 10 of these credits are transferable into any four-year institution. 32 students graduated. They had the program for free. We're scaling it to 80 next year. This program will ultimately be scaled to have hundreds of students in it. They're picking up college credits for free, and that was in one semester. We're going to have 19 credits next year for those 80 students, so they'll get 19 credits for free. That gives them a huge leg up, but it does some other things as well. Here's some of the quotes from that program. Even though I struggled, I still feel motivated to attend college. Getting to come to MATC and UWM was a great experience, made me want to keep studying. I can tell you a majority of the students had never been on a college campus before. They were intimidated. This is about confidence. Here's another student. She said, college is hard, but so is life. 
great realization. So being able to have a sneak peek to this new chapter of my life was much needed and great appreciated. I have to tell you a foil to this, and that is the student who said, you know, I've been kind of slacking off in high school. I was kind of sliding. I thought when I got to college it would be the same way. I was going to pull the wool over their eyes too. She said, within a week I realized this was not the case. I had to really change my whole outlook. And she said, I'm really glad. It was the hardest thing I ever did, but it's the most rewarding. But the perhaps most uh, telling story, and this speaks to life in Milwaukee for unfortunately too many individuals. This student said, I never thought I'd make it to college, graduate, or even live this long. So thank you all for giving me more hope. I can tell you with the family and the students and the educators who were there last week, nothing got more applause than this, and it brought tears to some people's eyes because it's real. This is the challenge that unfortunately too many individuals face in this um, region and frankly in other areas of the state as well. We don't have a unique ownership of this particular issue. We have a state that has affluent and relatively affluent individuals, and then we have a number who are impoverished. And that's the reality. We have on our campus, na campuses nationally, 50% of students who report food insecurity. That number is actually higher in some of our campuses. These are some real and significant issues. So one of the students who helps tell the story of whom we're very proud is Trey Kwan. He graduated um, this semester, and I'd like uh, him to talk about his story. I was the first male in my immediate family to walk across the high school graduation stage. I had a $100,000 scholarship to go to Morehouse. I had a 2.97 when we were supposed to maintain a 3.0. So I had lost $75,000 that was left on my scholarship. That's when I returned home to come to UW-Milwaukee. So I work as a site coordinator advisor for Milwaukee Public Schools College and Career Centers, working with students on college essays, scholarships. So when I get this master's degree, it's not bragging rights for me. I feel like it's bragging rights for the community. And that's why I do it, working in education, to change lives, to impact students, and to be a role model. I think it's just surreal. And I can't wait to uh, just walk across that stage and be able to take the degree back to my mom, my brother, my daughter, just to be able to show everyone else it's possible. I did it. You can do it. I feel like losing a scholarship was the best thing that happened to me. Coming to UW Milwaukee made me grow faster. It helped me learn more. It allowed me to get a bachelor's degree and now a master's degree. Isn't that neat? 5,300 students' success stories are like that at UW-Milwaukee this year. His is uh, incredibly powerful. The last workforce, I'm sorry, the last need that I'm going to talk about, um, and you know there's many more, but it's around the workforce. So again, we were set up uh, very well for this, and um, I'll share some more chocolate with you later for helping me with that setup. That, by the way, is one of Wisconsin's important needs. Chocolate, we're helping fill that in. Okay. so. With respect to the Wisconsin's workforce needs, I don't think um, that it could be said better than how President Cross said it. Every time we visit... Chancellor Mone is a flexible traveler uh, and has the ability to react in a split second. Uh, if we could take our seats, we'll uh, resume the presentation. I've been asked to wait to make sure we have all the regents back, and we have almost all the regents back. Um, Vice President Peterson, what do you advise? I would advise to keep forward. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, as, as uh, uh, one regent said, I knew your comments were hot. I didn't know that <laughs> they were that hot. Um, another perspective we have to look at is, I'm telling you that alarm was a false alarm. Apparently it's the humidity in one of the parking garage areas. Just another argument for capital budget improvements. <laughs> I'm sorry, so, so. <laughs> yes. So, so um, you know, that, if there's a headline coming out of this, I, I, hope that's, I hope that's what it is. You know, I had some momentum going, and, and now it's, it's going to double the length of my... No, I'm just kidding. I, I, uh, I, I think we can get it back and, and keep that momentum going. We were talking about workforce needs, and I don't think... Um, you know, I have to tell you, I, I had an editorial recently where I said, nine out of ten CEOs tell me the number one issue that, that they have is, is, you know, where do I find the talent when I need it and the right type of talent. A lot of people wrote back and said, very nice, well done, but who's that one CEO? 
you know, who doesn't need talent? I'm sorry, it's just that pervasive in terms of, of what we all are on the hunt for. So I don't think I need to talk at length. There's a lot of details behind these, but one is about the state of Wisconsin, which we're projecting, and when I say we, it's studies with M7 and uh, Milwaukee Metro Association of Commerce and Manpower in terms of funded work that WEDC has helped support. We know the workforce needs today are approaching 100,000 in Wisconsin in terms of employment opportunities. In southeastern Wisconsin alone, that number is exceeding 35,000. So those are the openings that we have right now. About 60% of those openings require a two-year or four-year degree. So this is significant in terms of, of what type of uh, preparation is required. So what we're doing is we're creating partnerships. And again, the theme here is around meeting Wisconsin's needs, but through collaboration. And that's the key. We don't have the wherewithal, and these problems are so significant, nobody can do it alone. So, for example, when I talked yesterday with Kathy Jacobson at Freighter, what we were talking about is how we're working together in some significant areas um, on, on the types of things that, that I'll, I'll share in a moment, but it's collaborative approaches. And so this is where our alumni, and we know the number is larger in terms of who's actually in the workforce. About a year ago, I was able to announce our partnership with Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute with Marquette University. This is over a 40, more than a $40 million investment on the part of the, the three institutions with three goals. Increase the talent pipeline in data sciences, which we know today includes the traditional MIS, IT, CIS types of areas, but really expands artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, data analytics, and many other fields. We need that talent those fields are transforming every, those, those disciplines are transforming everything from manufacturing, healthcare, data, um, analytics and education, and, and many, many other areas. So this is important. The second goal is to have Milwaukee recognized as more of a tech talent hub. And the third one is to solve applied research issues in data sciences, very important for the future. The next area I've talked somewhat before about, but I'd like to share it with you just a brief update around the Higher Ed Regional Alliance. Let's uh, talk about this in terms of a graphic that I think helps uh, spell it out pretty well. The goal across the middle, right under the bar, is to increase the percentage of individuals in the M7 region with high quality two or four year degree or advanced certificate to 60%. That number today is in the 40s. Across the state, we're also in the 40s. Um, and there's different pockets. What's fascinating is the different pockets. So for example, in southeastern Wisconsin, Racine, Kenosha, and Milwaukee, pull up the bottom. You have company, counties like Ozaki and Waukesha counties that are actually doing quite well. They're not at 60% though. None of us are at 60%, so we really need to raise that bar. Three goals, increased educational attainment. Dr. Ford of UW Parkside and Dr. Martin of MATC have done an incredible job leading this goal. They have helped us procure a half a million dollars in funding and in-kind uh, support from uh, College Completion America and some of the support in terms of organizations that are there, and they've held a number of workshops, conferences, where we've had hundreds of individuals from our respective institutions. Who? 18, two-year and four-year. Every single public, private, two and four-year in the M7 region is at the table. Presidents and chancellors of all those universities and, and institutions of higher ed. We have other partners, so we have Regent Hall from the Milwaukee Urban League, sits on our steering committee. We have Greater Milwaukee Committee, M7. We have Hispanic Professionals of Greater Milwaukee. Milwaukee Urban League, I'm sorry, we have um, the Hispanic Collaborative and a number of organizations that are working on these three goals. Educational attainment, we need to get more students through college, but you know, like I said earlier, we need to get them through high school. So we have linkages with, comp with organizations like Greater Expectations of Racine. And this is pivotal because they work with business and K-12 systems. We have linkages with Milwaukee Succeeds. Again, it's that K-12 linkage. We've got to bring the pipeline together. Having been here for a long time, we know this is a long game. You don't change educational outcomes overnight. It's amazing how it takes um, 18 years to get you know, high school graduates. It's a long haul. It's really Im important to recognize that. The second is around innovative programming, or what we call the program array. So when we talk about that, we're talking about oftentimes articulation agreements, and we're talking about what we know as three plus one, two plus two, programs where we have dual enrollment and better agreements to get students through college quicker. Think about an engineering degree. 
Many people would say it can't be done in three years. But if you do work with the right courses and the right faculty and the right commitments from superintendents and high schools, you can actually increase that number of students who actually come into college with advanced, uh, advanced placement in a significant way. There's a lot of different innovative programming that we do across and within our institutions. And then the third one, is around making a better bridge between employers and the, um, the, the higher ed institutions. Just as a practical example, we have employers such as Rockwell that cannot simultaneously hire at 18 institutions in southeastern Wisconsin. In fact, they, they hire from 14 institutions globally. Only 14, think about that. And so they have them all on a grid. I'm happy to report UWM does quite well on that grid. But I have to say that it would be so much easier for them to be able to access a lot of the talent in this region and for the talent to be able to stay here if they had a pipe, a portal. And that's what we're creating, is a portal so that it works both ways. One is that employers have a simpler way to access talent across the 18 institutions, but also so that our students have better opportunities for all those different op employment opportunities. The conversation with Kathy Jacobs and the president of Freighter yesterday was exactly about this area. Given the shortage in nursing, how can the institutions collaborate better and the big five healthcare employers in the region collaborate better to have ways to overcome the bottlenecks in nursing? And we know the bottlenecks in nursing are twofold. One is the nurse educator, and the other one is the simulation centers, because all our clinical settings are over, over capacity right now. So we're working through some of the details on that. Don't expect a big bang in six months on this. This is going to take at least that long in terms of the, the, the discussions. But it's very important. And this is the type of thing that Hera is working on. The nice thing about health care, as Regent Grevy knows, is that in this community we have the big five. So we don't have 4,000 manufacturers on this front, and we also don't have two. So you don't have two that are just competing with each other. So we think there's an awful lot of openness toward this from our preliminary discussions with healthcare senior leaders. This is a, a huge win for the region. So this is just one example. Across the bottom, you can see the number of students and what's at stake. And you can also see the fact that it's unprecedented. This is a world that is marked by competition. Higher ed is about competition oftentimes. But we're dropping those walls and we're saying the needs of the region are much larger than any one of us. We have to come together. And it's this great spirit and collaboration. So I'm really proud of what we've done and, and really uh, want to recognize again uh, Chancellor Ford for, for her co-leadership in this really important initiative. Um, in, in terms of um, the, the piece that's important is the personalized stories. This is a recent alum, and I'd like her to be able to tell her story. I figured that going to UW Waukesha was a good option for me because I would be able to live at home. My parents have been a really big support system for me in making decisions for my future. My dad graduated from UW Milwaukee and it's part of the reason why I chose to go to UW Milwaukee myself because he had a great time and he's very successful. After UW Waukesha, I transferred to UW Milwaukee and I declared finance as my major. The Panther Foundations for Success is an internship development program that equips undergraduate students with the skills and capabilities to have a seamless transition within the corporate workplace. When I joined PFS, I had interviews from Harley-Davidson and Rockwell Automation, and I picked Rockwell Automation to fulfill my internship for the summer of 2018. At Rockwell Automation, I was able to complete a global margin analysis. In addition, I was able to travel to Monterey, Mexico to complete an inventory audit. What I like the most about UWM is the support system I have here. Victoria Pryor has been a very big support system in my life. Not only is Victoria the director of PFS, but she also is in charge of the BCC, which stands for the Black Cultural Center. And it's been a phenomenal experience to get to work with her. So what I really like about this story is not just how proud we are of Ashley, but her father, Brentel, who has been so important for our alumni advisory board, and um, the fact that this is um, underscoring Panther Foundations for Success. This program is a partnership with today nine different um, Milwaukee area organizations, including some of the leading, leading firms from Northwestern Mutual, Rockwell, Harley-Davidson, and others. And um, it's a huge success story. I think uh, with a conversation with We Energies yesterday, not to commit them, uh, but they sound like they're, uh, they're uh, pretty close to, to jumping in as well. So it's, it's quite neat. So when we aggregate and summarize across a lot of these different areas, 
You have a handout, and this has been distributed by our Vice Chancellor Van Harpen earlier this morning um, in a couple of different uh, the business and, and capital areas, but you have this. This is a summary of some of that data, and it shows that, that across the left-hand side, what we did is we aggregated from a number of different data sources what are the fastest growing fields and the highest need areas in the state of Wisconsin. These are the needs on the employment sector. And then the question is, how are we filling them? What's the solution? Every year, and I can go back and show this data for the last decade, these are the approximate numbers across the last decade, 1,800 graduates in health-related fields. Now, keep in mind, there's a dozen different fields. So we're not putting out that many nurses a year. Um, we're not putting out that many psychologists or occupational therapists, but in aggregate. Same thing in business. Per year, over 1,500 students in undergrad and graduate programs in business. Computer science, you can see the numbers, engineering and science. This represents 80% of our graduates. Important fact, 80% of our graduates go into the highest need and fastest growth areas. There's another 20% that don't show up on this chart. So for example, criminal justice. We share with another academic institution in the state the honors of being the second, first and second largest programs in criminal justice. These populate important professions in police, security, police chiefs, where we have a very high number of our graduates. But they don't show up on the chart. But I don't think anybody would argue those are not important. Similarly, there's a lot of other fields that, that um, don't get necessarily reflected, but they all go in to contribute in important ways. So this is on an annual basis. As I turn a corner, start to wrap up, hopefully we won't need another intermission. Elaine, don't arrange that again. Um, you know, I know I talk a long time, but, but uh, we, we, uh, are, we should, be, should be okay. Um, UWM at a crossroads. And this is, I think, an important perspective to take. If I didn't talk about this, it would be, oh, it's a great story, a lot of momentum. But the reality is, um, like most higher ed institutions, we have to look at the reality. And if you were in the business meeting this morning, you saw some things um, that, that you know, talk about the inner workings. If you um, work through uh, issues that we talked about in terms of what our provost shared this morning with regard to, to um, you know, the things that we're doing around our outstanding learning environment, our chief enrollment officer, um, Katie Miota, talking about those types of activities this morning, we know we have to move in, in some different directions. So with a little structure, what I'd like to point out, as you see on this slide, is we are doing a tremendous amount with fewer resources. You do not get to be in the top 3% of research universities in this country by accident. There's a tremendous amount of intentionality. There's a lot of hard work that has taken to get there. So we're doing some things where we manage our budget responsibly. Um, in fact, we are one of the most under-resourced R1s in the country. When we first attained R1 status in 2016, there were 120 institutions. The salary for faculty were arrayed. We were number 120 out of 120 in terms of faculty pay. We're at the very bottom. Today, with 131 in there, we're not quite at the bottom, but we're among the bottom. In terms of number of faculty, we're probably in the top four, bottom four in terms of total number of faculty. Our faculty have gone down from about four to five years ago where we had almost 850 faculty uh, permanent tenure track. Today, we're barely at 700. So when I say here it's difficult to sustain in light of our dual mission around the additional resources that are required for access, as well as research, and again, we're the only one of those in the state of Wisconsin, the only campus that has both of those, and they're both expensive. It's very difficult to sustain that. Faculty are poached routinely. I've told you before stories about when I go to the national conferences, and one of the first things that happens is presidents and chancellors apologize, and they say, your faculty are so underpaid, it's the easiest thing for us to pick them off. It's, it's, it's disheartening. It's very frustrating. And so that's, that's a real issue. Retirements, as they occur, it's hard to replace them. We don't have the budget. I cut $41 million out of the budget in my first three years as chancellor. That's not a growth. It's very hard to diversify. I want to become a Hispanic-serving institution, but it's very difficult to do that if you don't have more faculty of color and staff of color. When you're retrenching, it's hard to grow. So that's the crossroads that we're at. We're doing this responsibly. In fact, I would argue heroically. The incredible work ethic and, and admirable work of our faculty and staff. So this is my argument for making a case to think about um, the importance of reinvestment. The priorities, as you know, as you've supported and so I'm, I'm so grateful for, are around compensation, 
around the capacity building and around the capital budget. Those are some of the critical areas. There's more, but in terms of the most acute needs. Our graduates have shared already almost 190,000 and how they fill the talent pipeline and they go on to, to such great uh, careers. And they largely stay in Wisconsin. The research, I mentioned earlier, I'd mentioned public health. There's a lot of epidemics, there's a lot of diseases in this country and worldwide. Our school of public health, the importance of research just in one school alone is around what we know today, it's in the headlines all the time, measles, and childhood vaccinations and the importance of that. But we can go on and we can talk about infant mortality. In Milwaukee, again, I hate to keep bringing some of these unfortunate statistics up, but infant mortality among African Americans is among the worst in the country. We have gotten slightly better a number of different dimensions. The lead issues that have affected residents in the city of Milwaukee, teen pregnancy, teen suicide, a uh, number of different activities, opioid crisis, I could go on and on, but our School of Public Health is studying these, working on policy, working on behavioral, working on clinical applications, as well as other parts, but that's just one school. Collaborations, I've stressed those, I hope, enough throughout these comments. It is about collaborating. It's an attitude that pervades what UWM is about. It's not territory, it's not turf, it's how can we work better together. That's been a theme that I've talked about since 2014. We can do a lot more. If we can do this well with our resource scarcity, think about what more we could do. So in summary, we're a powerhouse. I think you see that. We punch above our weight. It's a phrase I like to use a lot. It's important for this region. It's important for the state of Wisconsin. We have, and we feel, it's in our DNA, a unique mission, and it's about commitment to serve. It's the urban location that's the largest economic hub in the state, and how we respond innovative, innovatively to these challenges and really help solve them. We're very focused on metrics, we're very focused on that, whether it's around employment, economic development, education, public health, and beyond. We're so grateful for your support unanimous support that you've provided for our budget, for our needs. We need to keep persistent. We need to stay on that. We need to continue through the, the entire budget cycle. And I have to tell you, you know, standing back at a personal level, I've been at UWM for 30 years. Um, some would say, um, time to move on. And some would say, uh, so when are you going to retire? Um, there's those conversations that come up. It's interesting. Um, I don't have any plans on, on doing that, by the way. But, but um, Ray might have some for me. But uh, <laughs> I love this campus. I love the city and state. We have really moved up. The city, and I, when I came here in 89, I think about um, comments people made. I came from outside of Seattle, and people said, yeah, we have, we have like Nordstrom's, you know, our Nordstrom's is Kohl's. And, and they, they talked about how our cuisine is, is um, the, 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 the restaurants, I won't denigrate any further, but, but it, was, it was just kind of funny, the comparisons that were made. But I can tell you today, world-class city. I can tell you the sports, the arts, the, the vibrancy, but at the same time, two Milwaukee's, like there are two Wisconsin's in some ways. And UWM, as I've talked about before, is part of that triumvirate. What I mean by that is as this city has grown, UWM has grown, and I think we're a causal agent. When I came in 89, we were a research three, R3, middle of the pack. Thousands of positions behind where we are today. That's no exaggeration. There's 4,000, there's five, what's the number? Chancellor Blank, you might know, in terms of number of R1s in the country, I think the number is, is like, it's over 43, 4,400. So the point is, we were in the, the third, third tier, middle of the third tier. In, in 2000, I'm sorry, 1994, we became an R2. So we were really moving up. To move up, it's hard. And we became, in 2016, an R1. I have seen this campus change dramatically. I saw part-time PhD programs that today are full-time, twice the number. We are doing things at a level that's unbelievable, and we're a crown jewel. Not just in the UW system, but frankly in, in the country. So it's, it's um, that type of crossroads that I have to draw forward and say, with the continued investment, with the continued support, we can continue to do great things. So I want to thank you for that. We're going to continue to seize opportunities, make a difference, and strengthen the city and strengthen the state of Wisconsin. Thanks for your engagement, and sorry about our interruption here today. So.
very kind. Thank you. It's a team effort. I'm just so so uh, proud of our team. So presentation, and you know, you can see as we're here every year, the passion building the unprecedented collaboration that's taking place, the responsibility of doing all of that in a responsible budget manner. Um, kudos to you, to your Thank team. You. It's really, really refreshing to see. And we could have that happen on every campus, yeah. and we do. Yeah. But June is about Milwaukee, and you've certainly demonstrated that well. Regents, uh, Chancellor Mone is certainly open to questions. Mm -hmm. Who's got them? Regent Klein. Just a question on our work. How does it translate um, that it, it enhances the research? Where do, where is the fund, where do the funds come from if you're R1 versus a different yeah. R? So R1 um, is, is a recognition of the type of funding that you have, the number of postdoc students, the number of graduates, PhD graduates, and others in, in a variety of different fields. Um, and it really is a reflection of who's getting the funding, where it comes from, but it does give you more eligibility. You become, it grants, it's like success breeds success, and then being recognized as an R1, it helps when you're talking about actually receiving additional federal funding and that type of research, but it also has local impact. And the local impact is where we traditionally, in, in my previous roles, I would court companies for a lot of different partnerships, and they would, they would hold us back because we didn't have the research standing. And they'd say, we see you as a talent provider. We can do research with world-class universities, and they would go on and do that. Today, that story is 180 degrees turned around, and we have companies that come in and testify, and this, our best friends for arguments with the legislators is having CEOs and having vice presidents of technology and research that tell that story. So the benefits are both in terms of additional federal funding, opening doors for that, but also the local partnerships. And I think the partnerships that I've talked about really are magnified by that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Regent Bechtel. Thanks again, uh, Chancellor Mone. Really great presentation, and there is a great energy on this campus, which we appreciate for you and your team and faculty and the students. Can you give us a little more on the Data Science Institute? I, I think you, you indicated there's MIS, <coughs> IT, CSI type degrees. Yeah. Uh, but give us a little deeper dive, and if we're at 470 graduates today, what's the goal three years, five years, 10 years? Yeah, that's a really great question. Let me start with where this started. Um, our Vice Chancellor for Development Alumni Relations and I were visiting with um, CEO of Northwestern Mutual, John Schlifsky, a few years ago, and he said, if I could get 40 to 50 more individuals, actually his number was a little more conservative at that point, but it grew to become 40 or 50 more graduates in data science a year, that would, that would be so important and be, be very helpful. So Mike Lovell and I um, put together this idea to, to bring this together because there are loyalties and it comes down sometimes to the pragmatics. Mm -hmm. the, the, the top IT person, the top person who was driving this at Northwestern Mutual was an alum of ours and the top, the head of their foundation, which is very important in these things, is a graduate of Marquette. So they told us right up front, this is not going to go to one of you. You're not going to compete. It's got to involve both of you. So early on, we started this collaborative approach, which by the way, for us to do in, at this level is unprecedented. You just have never had that, as you probably know from, from being in the region. But the goal here is to increase for Northwestern Mutual. Yes, they have a self-serving interest, but that's the target that they have in mind as a minimum in that 40 to 50 range in terms of additional graduates. And I can tell you today, they already have many additional interns, literally today, and we don't even start the, the classes until this fall. We have the first time additional classes where we will teach them on site at Northwestern Mutual. So we'll have, we'll have a lot of additional programs. We hired our um, first co-director. We had an interim co-director. They've been working on curriculum, research projects, and we've allocated part of the funding for specific faculty and student research projects. But it covers 12 different fields. And one of the powerful things is that students now have the opportunity to expand. Um, in addition to like cybersecurity and a program in that, what we want to do is have data analytic, I'm sorry, data sciences opportunities across all our curricular areas because it truly is something where there's very few fields that are not becoming more data science oriented. And um, we've had programs and partnerships, for example, with uh, Milwaukee Brewers. And we had Moneyball, the science of baseball, and we had several leaders of that from the Brewers who are actually adjunct faculty teaching in our data analytics program. 
talk about a sellout. Talk about 400 people in one room, 250 in the over in the in the overflow room, because this is is just so attractive and so so important a topic. And it's not like it's one of these hot topics today and in three years. It's it's probably the future. So majors in a lot of different areas. And one of the compelling things that I think is important when you ask for more depth. We have, and we're starting in our business school, in our uh, uh, areas in engineering and in our School of Information Studies, but this is also something that at UWM, we have data science across all of our schools and colleges. So many faculty have come forward and said, I am in data science. And an example of that, two of the top people in data science at Northwestern Mutual have been PhDs in political science from UWM. So I mean, data science is just that pervasive, and that's the individuals who, who will grow and, and go across that. But again, it comes down to curricular development, fulfilling the talent pipeline across all the different areas, research problems, and the, the brand of this region as a tech hub. Other questions from regions? If none, let's give Chancellor Modi another round of applause. relatively close because as we've just heard one of the signature initiatives that UWM has been involved in is with the UW Systems Freshwater Collaborative for Wisconsin. UWM leads this initiative but it's actually a joint effort, more collaboration, involving all of our UW campuses to varying degrees. Today we're going to receive an update on how the Freshwater Collaborative is developing and the direction is it expected to proceed in the months ahead. So once again, Chancellor Mone on the other side of the table. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Vice President Peterson, Board of Regents, uh, President Cross, to, to address um, introductory comments about the uh, Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin. We had some initial comments with Regents at the Education Committee uh, some months ago when Chancellor Miller uh, was presenting his proposal for the undergraduate program uh, in fresh water at UW-Green Bay. And at that, re at that meeting, some of the education members, I think it was Regent Jones, who, who asked um, a little more detail uh, about some of the, the activities, knowing some of the, the work that we were doing across the UW system. So I'm going to provide just a brief overview. Chancellor Miller and Chancellor Walker are going to come up next and provide some more detail, and then you're going to hear from every single campus. What this is, it's a statewide collaborative, unprecedented in the history of the UW system, where we're focusing on the 10 grand water challenges. You're going to hear what those are, and you're going to hear the strengths and opportunities that are represented across the system for us to do something that is bold and uh, game-changing for the state. Um, we have been working on this actually for two and a half years. So this is time now for it to come forward. Later today, I will give a, le a legislative update. We've been working uh, with pre presentations to a lot of state government officials as well as legislators, and I'll go through that. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to hear first of all about what we're doing, how we're going to do it, and uh, move, move uh, into this very, very quickly. So at this point, I'd ask uh, Chancellor Miller, Chancellor Walker to come up and share uh, their perspectives on uh, what we're going to do, and then we'll move quickly into each campus. So thank you, and I'm um, excited to uh, to be here to support and uh, participate in this very unique uh, system-wide initiative. Uh, this this is something that we've worked on uh, with the University of Wisconsin uh, Milwaukee for a number of years, and we're very excited about it. Uh, we think this is a very important moment in the uh, in the system UW system. Uh, to organize what are f very considerable um, collective assets in the area of um, uh, research and teaching and learning around fresh water, probably the most precious uh, global resource. We believe this is a talent issue, at, at least at uh, Green Bay. We believe it's also a, uh, a, a, a great opportunity for this system to lead as in a global talent issue. Right now, there's little doubt that we're at the beginning of a very uh, large and disruptive change in employment and uh, talent and skills related to employment. This is a global change. 
one of the estimates, one of the common estimates and one of the more, more uh, uh, favorable ones or ones people like to use is that 65% of children entering primary schools around the world are expected to work in jobs that do not exist. Uh, a recent study by the World Economic Summit surveyed uh, chief uh, human resources officers and strategy officers in 371 global uh, companies. And in the summary, those uh, leaders of those companies f found that the third most important driver of the disruption in, in uh, employment and skills in the coming age uh, surrounds climate change and resource needs, uh, resource dynamics, in particular water. Uh, they thought this was more important over Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and robotics. So in Wisconsin, where we have virtually every uh, freshwater ecosystem uh, at our disposal and a long history of working in, uh, in freshwater, we think this is a great time. Uh, and we think there are a few places in the world where uh, a group of universities can, getting together can uh, make as big a difference. So the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and I don't know if there's a slide, there was a slide. At one point, uh, we are uh, University of Wisconsin is the the uh, state's coastal university. We're operating on four. There, you, there, we're operating on four campuses. Uh, two of them are on the Lake Michigan coast. Two on the Gr Bay of Green Bay. Uh, we have natural properties, uh, natural areas along both uh, the uh, lake and Green Bay. Three major manufacturing hubs: shipbuilding advanced manufacturing, uh, major health care sector. The area in northeast Wisconsin has one of the largest agricultural economies in the state. And the understanding of the human interaction of the environment, particularly water, around all this commerce was, ex was the founding principle of the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And throughout our history, we have uh, sponsored research and participated with uh, our colleagues in the system uh, around freshwater, particularly in agriculture, groundwater, manufacturing, business, commerce, and diversity. And so we bring to this um, collaborative, a long history of collaboration with the University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee and with Madison, the Coffrin Center for Biodiversity, which is housed at the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay as a member of the Smithsonian Diversity Network, the Environmental Management and Business Institute, MB, one of the few institutes uh, in the state that looks um, intentionally and directly at the interface of the environment and business. And we are in the process of bringing the second uh, Natural Estuarine Research Reserve, NUR, uh, to the state of Wisconsin. So we're very excited about this. We think it's a very important, a very forward-thinking uh, collaborative. Uh, and we are ready to engage uh, with all of our colleagues in the state uh, to make it happen. And thank you for your support. Thanks, Chancellor Miller. Chancellor Walker from UW Superior. Yes, you'll hear from my colleague Jackie in a little bit about the specifics about UW Superior, but I want to talk about why we think that this is an exciting opportunity for all of us in the UW system. I think when you look at the sheer number of water-focused scientific assets that are in the state, it truly is unprecedented. And if they use the terminology, you know, water is the new oil or the new gold, well, by God, baby, you have got a good bet going because you don't have to drill for what we've got uh, in the state. These placed-based, non-replicable assets, I think, are really the strong, one of the great strong suits of the state of Wisconsin and why this is such an important initiative. If I think about what this means to our campuses and what we can do for the state, if we talk about comparative research on solutions, doing this is an, in an organized and efficient manner through collaboration and a systematic research agenda means that we can make real progress on real solutions much faster than we can operating by ourselves. And, and maximizing what works for Lake Superior, does that work for what happens on Lake Michigan? And what does that mean for the rest of the state? If we leverage our expertise from rural settings, which is one of the strengths that we have up north, to more industrialized settings, what does that transfer of knowledge look like? These students that we would produce would have an unparalleled set of experiences that they would be able to experience and a skill set that they would find very few places. Spurring innovation, we see technology-based solutions for making polluted water cleaner. And it's why we see all the interest up north in ballast water. But how do we take the knowledge of those technologies and techniques and leverage that across the knowledge that's there across the system? 
And I think what's also powerful is that we can make this happen across the state, that we can leverage the technology that's out there to have experiences, whether that's virtual field trips, physical field trips, the virtual lecture, the virtual classroom, the virtual lab project, to enable students from across the state to pick the very best specialized knowledge from each of our campuses as they develop and going forward. We can share data on hydroinformatics and engineering projects. I think of things like virtual innovation think tanks to help us use our best expertise across the system to develop policy and technology solutions. And if we talk about education, sure, we're talking a lot about the talent pipeline and, and what happens at the undergraduate and graduate level, but what happens through the K through 12? Think of the assets that we'll be able to mobilize there. So when I think about what our institutions bring to this table, what Superior brings to the table, it's a very exciting prospect. And so just a little bit of a romantic notion, W.H. Auden said that thousands have lived without love, but not one without water. Love it. I would argue millions uh, without. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, you've heard from two chancellors, and I have to tell you that any of the chancellors would be able to speak to the shrinks, and, and you will hear from them. They're all able to, to answer when we get to Q&A. The provosts in particular have really been driving a lot of the work across all of these campuses. What you're going to hear now, um, led by starting with a dean of our School of Freshwater Sciences, Val Klump, and uh, his associate dean, Tim Grundle, you're going to hear uh, some of the larger perspectives in terms of, well, how will we do that? Let's talk about the framework. What do we expect to achieve? And um, then all the provosts, as well as the faculty that you'll hear from, will be available to answer any questions that you might have. So with that, Dean Klump. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Mone. Um And uh, my job here in the next uh, few minutes is to basically uh, brief you on the motivation for this uh, initiative, which we've been going on for a little over two years now. Uh, I think everyone recognizes this water is a big deal, is a major problem. It is a global issue for sure. It's considered to be the single largest uh, resource challenge that we face in the 21st century. You can hardly pick up a newspaper without seeing a story about water problems across this globe. Um, it's a $500 billion a year industry globally, and that's projected to increase to $800 billion a year by the year 2035. Um, there are estimates that dealing with a sort of trifecta of water problems, that is water scarcity and supply, aging infrastructure, and global change is a 23 trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollar problem over the next decade or so. And this is leading to an increasing demand for hydrologists, engineers, policy analysts, data people, um, a whole variety of individuals who can uh, understand and anticipate water problems, but also create those solutions, um, implement those solutions, and manage the system. And so there's a tremendous demand uh, globally in this, in this water sector. But it's also an important uh, Wisconsin issue as well. Um, of course, it's always been mentioned that Wisconsin is defined by water. I mean, on our east coast and north coast, we have the world's greatest uh, freshwater resource on the planet, 20% of the world's surface freshwater. Our western boundary is the uh, largest river system in North America. Our southern boundary is full of bears fans, but you know, they care about water too. Uh, the largest uh, water intake in the world serves the city of Chicago over 2 billion gallons a day. And so uh, bears fans get it as well. Um, and in Wisconsin, uh, water plays a crucial role in our economy. The $88 billion uh, agricultural industry uses half a billion gallons of water a day. Our manufacturing sector, food production, um, food handling uses another, adds another 100 plus billion to our economy and uses another 400 million gallons of water a day. So, and including you know, recreation and tourism, which is an iconic industry, uh, certainly uh, for, for Wisconsin. And so, uh, freshwater is intimately tied to our economy and tied to workforce development in the state. Um, there is a, uh, here in, centered here in southeastern Wisconsin, but it has a footprint throughout the state, is a growing water technology industry collaboration. 
There are almost 240 companies now in this, uh, in this group, including some of the largest water uh, technology uh, companies in the world that have either headquarters or major um, investments here. It's over $500 million in economic development uh, since the formation of that group. And the goal, honestly, is to make Wisconsin the Silicon Valley of, of fresh water. Well, in order to be the Silicon Valley of anything, you've got to have a Stanford or you've got to have a Berkeley, or in our case, the University of Wisconsin system. And so uh, if uh, you look at then the demand for a workforce, uh, it's been estimated by UNESCO that something on the order of 78% of all jobs globally are, are water related. So it is a big deal. It's the fastest growing sector of the world's economy right now, the water sector is. Uh, and Wisconsin industries, as you've heard earlier today, uh, are facing significant worse force challenges, and it's true also in the water sector, where 68% of Wisconsin's water sector employers are struggling to find um, employees. And you also know that the number of college-age Wisconsin residents is declining. Um, 18 of the 29 most common occupations that require a bachelor's degree or higher um, had fewer Wisconsin graduates in 2016 than the estimated number of water sector job openings. So there is a demand that exceeds the supply, uh, even here in the state of Wisconsin. It's currently estimated there are around 60,000 employees in the water sector in Wisconsin. That's about 2% of the total employment in the state. And so uh, with this, we conducted a little over a year and a half ago a survey where we asked these employers um, in thinking about this freshwater initiative um, a few pretty simple questions. Uh, what was the market and the demand for uh, uh, water um, savvy employees? Um, what types of training uh, did they want their employees to have? And what was the growth potential in this field? Um, and the answers that came back was, for example, uh, new hires in the water sector required extensive training um, in water-related issues and once they joined the business. And it's not unusual for a business to have to train employees, but what's unusual here is that they mentioned was extensively they needed to train. So we asked them the question of, well, what about a degree that was interdisciplinary in nature, was water-focused? What do you think about that? And, and, and a plurality of them said they thought that was a good idea, that they would prefer that sort of training relative to sort of a traditional single disciplinary training. They understood the need for understanding water across multiple disciplines. And they also related that this was an area of growth for them in the future. <clears throat> and so, based on that, uh, we have developed what we're calling the Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin. And, and honestly, it boils down to two major goals, I think. One, and the first one, and the most important one, is to create a, a system-wide, sort of one-of-the-kind undergraduate program in freshwater here in Wisconsin. Um, at, the, at the outset of this, when, if you looked across system on paper, which I did, and you could see, wow, there's a lot of, you know, talent around system. Um, on the other hand, if you've done what I have done now, and I have visited all 13 campuses along with my colleagues, and you talk to the faculty, you talk with administrators, you tour the laboratories, you see the facilities, you stand in a cow pasture, um, you recognize the strength and, and assets that we have in the Wisconsin system is unparalleled. It is dramatic in my mind. Um, and so and I, it's, it's gonna be unique in the United States. There's no other institution of higher learning that is tackling this problem right now and few probably have the capacity that we have in Wisconsin. Um, and secondly, is to spur uh, research uh, to help solve Wisconsin water problem. I mean, it's important. Um, and so the idea here is to unleash the sort of collective uh, assets that the, the system brings to the table. Um, <clears throat> if you uh, uh, look at this uh, um, and uh, Actually, this was, this was supposed to be a little cleverer with an animation, but in any case, the, the water is an interdisciplinary topic. And you can see in that sort of diagram up there all the different sort of little icons involving water. Um, 
uh, at the outset of this, when I was first discussing with my faculty, I produced this sort of hairball diagram, which I showed all the various boxes of you know water issues and stuff, and all the connections between them. And and, they, and someone said, Val, you know, don't show that diagram. We can't do all of that. And I said, exactly. That is the point. No one institution can do all of this, but collectively in Wisconsin, we can. We have the capacity. We have the ability. And what the freshwater collaborative will do is, is draw those lines, make those connections among these institutions, amongst faculty, allow students to flow from institution to institution, create a really multiple educational pathways or new educational pipelines, if you will. A student can have a very individualized degree, but at the same time will be a significant amount of rigor applied to that. Um, and core requirements with respect to um, understanding basic principles, but also areas of competency and, and demonstrations of, of, of achievement. As I said, it's a very unique program. Uh, there is nothing like it uh, in the world. Uh, and it can be relatively seamless. Because we are a system, um, there are very few impediments that get in the way. I mean, there are a few. But we can easily overcome those so that a student can flow uh, between campuses, and that would be one of the one of the requirements. Um, you know, uh, Jack Welsh was famously said, the CEO, former CEO of GE, once said, you know, successful institutions should focus on their unfair competitive advantages. I can guarantee you, the Wisconsin system has an unfair competitive advantage when it comes to water, and that's something we should we should take advantage of. The uh, um, uh, just to give you sort of a concept map, and this is split up into four segments of a pie, but these, these slices are not all equal by any means. By far and away, the most important is the academic side uh, that I've mentioned. Um, and a key part of that, it, and a key part of the budgetary request, is for undergraduate scholarships. We understand that tuition can be an impediment for students, and so uh, we are dedicating a significant amount of money supporting uh, undergraduate scholarships. We're also interested in, 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 in fostering new uh, research collaboratives and networks across, um, across system. We've already begun to do that. Um, and I can speak just personally uh, as someone who studies dead zones in Green Bay. The proposals I put together today have to include a hydrodynamicist, a soil scientist, a watershed scientist, an economist, an agronomist and a water resource manager, you cannot, very few of those talents are embedded in a single institution. You really need to work across campuses to do that, and we, have, and we can do that. Uh, and it will also, at the same time, provide amazing research opportunities for students, both at the graduate level and at the undergraduate level. The third piece, then, is sort of the marketing and recruiting piece. It's much, much smaller, but it's uh, yeah, no less important, I think. I mean, our goal is to make Wisconsin the place to come to get an education in, in water. And my son happens to live in, in San Francisco, and you know, they, uh, um, they have enormous water problems in California. Um, uh, and I can't imagine that a parent in California doesn't look at this and say to their kids, you know, uh, this, is a, this is an area in which it's important, there's a great career to be had, where should you go to get an education? The first thing that should pop up is Wisconsin. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, um, and if you look at the 16,000 freshmen that entered the comprehensives, this was a couple years ago, the last time I looked at it, there were 21 students from California out of 16,000. We can do a lot better job, I think, uh, and bring uh, new students to Wisconsin. So one of the primary objectives of this, of this initiative is to bring new students into Wisconsin. Students who would leave the state to go elsewhere, but students who are outside the state who would come here specifically for this. It's really kind of an extension, a freshwater you know, equivalent of the Wisconsin idea in many respects. The organizing principle, and I think you've been uh, uh, given this uh, matrix, which requires a, uh, <clears throat> a magnifying glass to read, actually. Um, and in terms of, we've identified 10 grand water challenges. And these represent the, the challenges that we face here in the state, but they're also challenges faced globally. We've also identified institutions within the system that have strengths in these particular areas that we're calling lead institutions. Now, that's not to say that they don't have faculty expertise in 
more than one or maybe all of these areas, but they have particular strengths in a few. Uh, this proposal is for is for over a six-year period, so in terms of prioritizing how we move forward, this sort of implementation matrix um, is is sort of the organizing organizing principle. Um, <clears throat> and I will say that uh, uh, it's really the you know the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we have on here, you know, challenges, solutions, benefits, stakeholders. Uh, suggested projects, et cetera. If we were to fully kit this out, it would take a microscope to read. Um, but in any case, uh, so it is really the tip of the iceberg. And with that respect, um, I'm now going to uh, allow my colleagues at the various campuses to come forward, and, and we've asked them to spend 90 seconds. And one of my buddies said, I, I can't say boo in 90 seconds. So, you know, and I understand that. So you're going to get the tip of the tip of the iceberg, if you will. But the point is, is and and and, uh, and uh, you know, this is largely symbolic in a way, but it does demonstrate we are all in on this. Every campus has a stake in this, and so uh, without further ado, I will invite um, our first. We're going to do this in alphabetical order, and and uh, I guess the first one up is Eau Claire and Pat Klein. <laughs> you who speak French or recognize Eau Claire is Clearwater, and so it's not surprising we're very excited about this initiative. You'll also notice we have a very large river that runs right through the middle of our campus. What many of you don't know is in the back of the campus is another one, the Little Niagara. So fresh water is really, really critical to us. You can see the departments that work, <clears throat> excuse me, all those departments have faculty members who are working on specifically surface and groundwater. I think what you might not know about Eau Claire, though, is that 26% of the large-scale agricultural work in this state is around Eau Claire, and 100% of the silica sand, frac sand mining, is around Eau Claire. So for us, the whole notion of studying fresh water, keeping the contaminants out of the water, making better health outcomes for all of the students, families, et cetera, that live in our area, it's very, very important. We're extremely excited. And I can't go without saying something. As a woman in STEM, I didn't ask for those pictures, but please notice how many women are involved in water research. Thank you. Chancellor Miller has, uh, has already spoken. You, you, you want to add something to what you uh, previously said? Okay, next slide. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Mark from La Crosse. Good afternoon. Um, located on the banks of the Mississippi River, UW La Crosse has been engaged in research, teaching, and outreach in aquatic science for more than 50 years. The departments of biology, chemistry, geography, geography and earth science, and microbiology offer undergraduate and graduate degrees in aquatic and environmental sciences. These academic programs are enhanced by non-curricular units and external cooperative agreements to provide research and career development opportunities for our students. For example, our River Studies Center was created in 1972 and is comprised of 23 faculty from eight different departments. For 15 years, it was the home of our Wisconsin Distinguished Professor, one of only two Wisconsin Distinguished Professors at a comprehensive campus. We've also hosted five international conferences in aquatic science. Since 2010, the River Studies Center has competitively obtained more than $10 million in external grants for student-focused research and educational programming. A long-standing formal cooperative education agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center in La Crosse provides internship and employment opportunities to our students. State-of-the-art analytical, microscopy, and aquatic science labs and our newly constructed Prairie Spring Science Center provides physical support for laboratory-based coursework and research. Boats and a diverse array of sampling equipment facilitate <coughs> field-based studies. Curricular and research strengths at UWL include river science, the bioaccumulation and effects of aquatic contaminants, nutrient pollution, and the impacts and control of aquatic invasive species. With these resources, the UWL is well positioned to expand its educational, research, an outreach mission in riverine and aquatic sciences well into the future. Thanks, Val. And next is uh, Jake Vanderzang. Jake's the uh, director of the Center for Limnology at UW-Madison. Jake. 
Great, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'd just like to say a little bit about the role that UW-Madison can play in this uh, larger initiative. As a large research university, uh, we're obviously very invested in the research enterprise in addition to the teaching and outreach mission of, of UW-Madison. Um, UW-Madison has a tremendously broad uh, <coughs> program in aquatic and freshwater related topics. And I think the best uh, way to summarize that would be the breadth of our cross-campus umbrella group. And I'm not saying umbrella group just because it relates to water. But we have a group called Water at UW-Madison that's highlighted in the bottom left on my slide. And with this cross-campus group called Water at UW-Madison, we have 100 affiliated faculty members and permanent scientists at UW-Madison who have interests in areas relating to water. And it's incredibly diverse, and it spans all of those departments and units you see listed there that you can't even read. Um, in terms of specific units with water-related uh, uh, emphases, we have the Aquatic Sciences Center, which administers statewide programs relating to a, a wide range of freshwater issues. We have the Center for Limnology, which is where I'm the director, and uh, UW-Madison is the, the um, birthplace of the field of limnology in North America. Um, we have Water Science and Engineering Lab, which is a large facility that, ha that has all sorts of aquatic types of analyses. Um, in terms of graduate programs, we have multiple graduate programs that emphasize uh, water or have strong water emphases. And in the drive on the way here, we are trying to count how many graduate programs had a water emphasis and we couldn't really come up with that number. Um, and of course, research is a really key uh, aspect of what we do and we have lots of experience uh, running and obtaining federal research dollars. These programs are generally interdisciplinary and uh, we have a tremendous amount of experience to bring to the table in that realm. And so uh, Water at UW-Madison is again this cross-campus group that kind of brings together the larger community of water people at UW-Madison. Our strengths are listed there too, but we, we have uh, activity in a wide, wide range. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tim Grundle is the Associate Dean at the School of Freshwater Sciences here at Milwaukee. Uh, thank you for... Thank you for uh, listening to us here. I'm here to uh, bring out the assets that UWM will bring to this particular project, uh, primarily the School of Freshwater Sciences itself, which was uh, instituted, uh, incorporated in 2010, but the previous institution, research institutions that preceded it could go back 50 years. Uh, we're the largest uh, research institution on the Great Lakes. Uh, we maintain the only uh, vessel capable of uh, uh, operating on the open lake, as well as a fleet of six other vessels that are smaller and are, are made for near shore and inland lakes. Uh, we have two endowed centers uh, that I want to mention, one for water policy and one for genomic studies. Uh, the Water Policy Center came out of our realization that water issues today are not just the natural sciences, but that if we really need to have social scientists, economists, and poli poli policy people on board, and so that's what that's all about. Uh, the other uh, stem of, of our university is the water people, uh, the water faculty within the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, who just this morning uh, got their program uh, uh, as a separate undergraduate program okayed by your uh, education committee. Uh, they uh, have been around for a long time. They are uh, quite involved in those two centers, the uh, Water Equipment and Policy Center and the Water Technology Accelerator, which are both uh, industry, uh, academic, cooperative programs that are designed to bring scientific ideas to uh, commercial applications. If I uh, try to list our strengths, uh, that's a different slide. <laughs> <laughs> our strengths uh, would include, uh, of course, Great Lakes studies and coastal management. Uh, we also uh, have a lot of uh, strength in the uh, toxicology and water quality, per se. Uh, and uh, I think the last bullet that I had on my slide anyway said uh, industry co uh, collaboration and that, th that's a bullet that I can't really talk about in great detail in 90 seconds but it encompasses uh, the idea that we've had uh, at Freshwater Sciences for many, many years and I'm going to sound like a broken record here but that collaboration and sharing of, of resources is just the way to go and that's how we've done it at the Freshwater University. And what we're asking is that we do that at the system-wide level and make uh, Wisconsin a place on the map where people go to solve a water problem. Thank you. Colleen McDermott from UW Oshkosh. Good afternoon. 
We like to call Oshkosh Oshkosh on the water. Our Oshkosh campus is located on the Fox River and we are steps away from Lake Winnebago and Lake Butamore. Our Fond du Lac campus is on the southern end of Lake Winnebago. But not only is UW Oshkosh uniquely located on these important bodies of fresh water, but we have a strong faculty, strong teachers in many departments with expertise in all of the aspects of freshwater science, from groundwater to surface water, from drinking water to recreational water. Today I'd like to emphasize two reasons why we would be great partners in the Freshwater Collaborative. First, we've been involved in carrying out the requirements of the Beach Act since its passage by the U.S. Congress in 2000. Our faculty, staff, and students monitor water quality at beaches along northern Lake Michigan from Manitowoc to Kiwani to Door Counties. Um, in addition, we help many lake associations in Vilas County up north um, to monitor beach water for safe recreational use. Our student interns learn the science firsthand and are able to give back to Wisconsin communities. Second, we run a state-of-the-art laboratory on our Oshkosh campus, the Environmental Research and Innovation Center, which is a DATCAP certified laboratory for analysis of water quality metrics. Everything from minerals such as arsenic, lead, iron, um, to nitrates, to harmful algal toxins, to bacteria. The lab currently partners with 20 Wisconsin counties 800 privately owned businesses and more than a thousand homeowners in Wisconsin to test drinking water samples from private wells. And our Eric Lab is ready and able to do many other types of water quality analysis. We think a freshwater collaborative is critical to maintaining and improving water quality in Wisconsin, for training our students for future careers in water, and UWO is poised to be a significant partner in the collaboration. Thank you. Jessica Olafsky from UW Parkside. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. So I'm here to represent UW Parkside, and like many of the other campuses, we also are located in a strategic place for working on fresh water. So we have uh, right at the boundary of the Lake Michigan watershed where we get to experience the flow into the lake as well as some of the um, issues uh, across the board from our rural to urban transition, so where we're located. Um, some of the assets that Parkside brings to this collaborative effort, which we completely support, include our uh, brand new um, SC Johnson Integrated Science Lab, which has state-of-the-art equipment. And what I think is really special about Parkside's contribution in this area is it's not just a lab for graduate students, it's a lab for undergraduate students. So they really get that experience that gets them into the workforce. They get the experience that uh, gets them where they need to go. And likewise, we have our GIS Spatial Analysis Lab, which is something that we're working with our community partners. Again, students are getting those direct experiences that really enhance their marketability. And one of the truly special things about UW Parkside is its connection to the community and its commitment to outreach and translational science and um, social interest. So we also have and host the Root River Environmental Education Community Center, which works with um, underserved populations in the city of Racine, as well as the Center for Environmental Education, Demonstration and Applied Research, the Cedar Center, which also uh, reaches out to communities in Kenosha. So I know that there's overlap between the strengths of Parkside and other campuses, and I think that is a place to grow our collaboration, where we really <coughs> specialize in translating information to community partners and industry by working in issues like uh, bioremediation, biomonitoring, restoration, habitat management, hydrology of every level from groundwater to surface water, and especially in water quality issues. And I just want to leave you with um, an emphasis that Parkside is able to increase its capacity, reach out to collaborators, and really be a good partner with its community where we have a, a major emphasis on community-based learning. Thank you. Uh, 
Ann Wills. Good afternoon. Um, Platteville is very excited about this collaboration, and I must say that one of the things that I have found to be the most positive is that it is an interdisciplinary major that um, we are looking at creating on our campus. And the bright, energetic new faculty, newer faculty who frankly um, are on the tenure list today that got involved in this project are just very exciting to be in a room with them for an afternoon and talk about their ideas and the things that they want to do as they move forward um, has certainly provided a lot of energy for me. Uh, you can see our assets. Um, we are excited about the ties to agriculture, um, along with biology, chemistry, uh, geoscience, um, the environmental engineering program and our reclamation programs. Uh, we have a significant number of labs already in all those areas, and we are right now planning uh, a, uh, remodeling of our Babel Hall, and we have added a freshwater lab in there that will tie with all of those programs. <clears throat> in addition, um, Southwest Wisconsin uh, has the unique driftless area landscape, which um, provides the uh, small watersheds and um, the opportunities for some different um, experiences for students who are interested in undergraduate research. And we're also pleased that um, the, water, the driftless area goes up through the Baraboo area, where we have um, now um, our two uh, branch campuses, Baraboo, Sauk County, and Richland. Richland has that very um, extensive agriculture piece, and uh, Baraboo, Sauk is certainly um, very close to the Devil's Lake area. And so we are excited about the opportunities for research in those areas as well. So thank you. David Travis, um, River Falls. Good afternoon. Thanks for allowing us some time to talk about this great, important opportunity. At River Falls, we're very excited about this opportunity. Um, some of the assets that we have, I think, to offer to this collaboration are starting with our geographic location. We are very close to the St. Croix River Basin. We're actually in the heart of the River Basin itself, only about 10 miles as the crow flies from the St. Croix itself. And we have tributaries from the St. Croix flowing through campus, through the area around town. And our students are actively engaged in research, uh, both uh, for their own scholarly work as well as interacting with the community. I think one of the things to emphasize that we have, and you've heard some of this from the other partners, is we're really engaged with our, our community and our industrial partners. Our faculty serve on boards, they chair boards, and they interact on a regular basis with the local community and industry to look at the uh, opportunities that, for instance, removing of local dams may provide to improve the water quality in the area. Uh, this type of collaborative relationship, I think, is something that's only going to grow as challenges related to water continue to increase. Another noteworthy uh, asset is from our geographical location is the fact that we're in the most rapidly growing county in Wisconsin. And that really has a lot to do with the urban sprawl from the Minneapolis-St. Paul region crossing over the river into far western Wisconsin. We believe new challenges related to the urban-rural interface will become a bigger and bigger issue related to water. We think that we're well positioned. We're already doing work of that sort. We think that challenge will also grow. Several of our faculty that work in water are also funded partly uh, through UW Extension. That partnership has led to great opportunities in working with local farmers, the dairy industry, other types of food providers, and looking at water-related issues. And that connection, not just in western Wisconsin, but throughout the state, would be, I think, a great asset to this collaboration. As far as specific strengths beyond that, it's clearly, River Falls is known as an ag school. We have two lab farms uh, on or adjacent to campus. We have opportunities for our students to work on those farms on a regular basis, looking at the, the issues that water presents with agriculture and vice versa, uh, looking at nutrient runoff, ground contamination. Uh, we do have a campus groundwater well network that our students and faculty are regularly monitoring to look for um, evidence of nutrient runoff and creation of water contamination. And generally speaking, our faculty um, are very committed to a broad water management and curriculum type of programs. And what that means basically is that River Falls is already comfortable in working in a very interdisciplinary way. These programs cross over multiple departments and 
uh, two different colleges. And so there's a natural comfort zone already in place for collaboration across our campus, which would connect very comfortably to collaborations of the same sorts across uh, other institutions throughout the state. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this. Brian Schloss, UW Students Point. Good afternoon. Um, as would not be surprising with a campus like ours that is known so much for natural resources, environmental issues, and sustainability, it, it was really a pleasure about two and a half years ago when we first started this, we did a study to look at where do we stand in terms of market share of the undergraduate world. And we determined that we're the third largest water resource program in the nation. When we had that first meeting at Milwaukee, many of our friends and colleagues said, part of our goal is to get you to the number one. We welcome that challenge. What we see in our college with this opportunity is across system, there's a veritable all-star roster at all of the campuses when it comes to water expertise. We do so much at our campus in terms of water. Everything, every one of the, the lakes mentioned, we published and do work in marine systems, various uh, wetland systems. But even at that, we scratch the surface barely <coughs> of what the water uh, resource environment can house. So we want to take advantage of the resources we have at Point, which include things like the USGS, Wisconsin Cooperative Fishery Research Unit, facilities in aquaculture and aquaponics, UW Extension partnerships in water, watershed management, groundwater, and various other expertise in terms of environmental history, geology, geography, GIS capabilities, and many others. We want to take advantage of that to build the next generation of CNR majors to build the next generation of UWSP graduates and take them into this new water. Part of what we hope to do is we hope to elevate aquaculture and aquaponics to a full-scale major. We hope to develop and <coughs> launch our ecosystem design and remediation program and to develop and finalize our environmental engineering program, which just does not duplicate those programs in the state, but builds out of CNR expertise and other campus expertise to take us into that realm. Thank you. Good afternoon. As noted on the slide, UW Stout has a number of assets related to water. And we feel that UW Stout will be a very strong partner in this collaboration. One example is a National Science Foundation funded Lakes Research Experiences for Undergraduates program a long-running program on our campus that brings in very highly qualified students from across the country to address important issues related to freshwater, particularly in our local lake, which has significant eutrophication uh, issues. In addition, the campus runs a center for limnological research. This is a service organization that provides services for chemical analysis and physical analysis of watersheds and has worked with a number of different lake associations in our area. In addition, the university a number of, uh, has worked with a number of partners in our local lake association and has collaborated, for example, on a Red Cedar Watershed Conference, a yearly conference that has taken place for a number of years. Many of our faculty have grants and other relationships with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and other state and federal agencies that are involved with water. In addition, Stout has the benefits of a lot of focus on interdisciplinary work. That's part of our polytechnic designation and would be a key part of our collaboration. In addition, on our campus, we have programs that really touch on water. These include environmental science, our applied social science program, which has been heavily involved in our, our lakes grant, and then also conservation biology at the master's program. So as I mentioned, I think we'll be a strong partner in this collaboration and look forward to the opportunity. Thank you. Next up is UW Sphere. Chancellor, did you want to add anything to what you've already said? She's, oh, okay. I'm going to take the mic if it's okay. <laughs> I'm Jackie Weisenberger for, representing UW Superior as interim provost. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, we are located in a unique position on Lake Superior, hence the name UW Superior. 
we have the benefit of that location to engage in numerous research activities. Uh, actually, the institution has been engaged in uh, lake-related and uh, river-related research for o well over 50 years uh, through our Lake Superior Research Institute, as well as our Great Lakes Maritime Research Institute and our Transportation and Logistics Research Center. Uh, some of the research that we've been focusing on, at least recently, have been looking at uh, aquatic invasive species through our ballast water research uh, through the shipping industry. We've also been looking into uh, well water um, toxins and checking our regional uh, well water um, uh, sources of, of drinking water. We also conduct research on uh, contamination of our lakes, rivers, and streams in the area, and their students benefit greatly from, from all of that research. Uh, in terms of academic programming, we offer uh, programming in the areas of aquatic biology, fishery science, chemistry, and our uh, newly uh, developed environmental science program, which is very popular with students. All of these areas of, of academics, uh, we engage students in applied research uh, experiences, and they're required as a high-impact practice before they can finish their different academic programs. <laughs> One other area that's of interest, perhaps, to this group is that we have faculty engaged in looking at uh, plastics in our, uh, in our freshwater streams, lakes, and, uh, of course, Lake Superior um, in the region. So we've been engaged in this, as I said, for well over 50 years. We're excited about the potential collaborations and would like to see uh, more support from the state and perhaps from this body so that we can get even more uh, resources and get more involvement and get our students prepared for the, for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, last but certainly not least, UW Whitewater, Elizabeth Harahay. Thank you, good afternoon. UW Whitewater is surrounded by a variety of water resources, including lakes, small streams, larger rivers, and a variety of wetlands, including a bog and several fens. We are conveniently positioned then to study the impacts to these water resources and also the management and restoration of them. UW Whitewater has a modern, well-equipped instrumentation laboratory that allows us to identify and quantify contaminants of various sorts, uh, also nutrients, heavy metals, and the interesting thing about this lab is that it is predominantly run by undergraduate students who are conducting a variety of cutting-edge research projects with their faculty mentors. We also have a geographical information system center where a wide variety of um, work is being done with the focus on water using the latest software and equipment, including drones. Um, Dr. Eric Compass recently uh, equipped a couple of kayaks and took some students down the Rock River so that he could do real-time water quality monitoring. Our Fiscal and Economic Research Center and our Institute for Water Business support faculty and students in water-related research as well. Um, Professor Russ Cashin, for example, recently conducted an economic impact assessment on the blue-green algal blooms that frequently occur on Tainter Lake in Dunn County by UW Stout. UW Whitewater employs more than 20 faculty in two different colleges with expertise in our water-related research. And many of those areas coincide with the 10 grand challenges that were uh, listed earlier. Some of those areas of research include uh, wastewater treatment chemistry, blue green algal toxins, effects of pharmaceuticals and personal care products, various pesticides, um, impacts on aquatic organisms specifically, um, effects of climate change on coral reefs, water quality sensor development in the physics department, and the economic impacts of water pollution. UW Whitewater offers two unique majors in the water area, in addition to your typical ecology and environmental science majors. One is the uh, marine and freshwater ecology major. Students in that major study freshwater courses at UW Whitewater, before spending a year at Deakin University in Australia to do their marine studies. 
Um, we also have an integrated science and business major with a water resources emphasis. Those students are required to conduct an internship, and many of them do that with various water industries in the Milwaukee area. And they are also required to do a substantial paper in their senior year in which they identify a particular water problem, come up with solutions that uh, incorporate uh, information and ideas from both science and business. In summary, UW-Whitewater and all the UW campuses are committed to working towards improving water quality in the state of Wisconsin through education, collaborative research, service, working with key stakeholders, and bringing skilled employees to the water industry. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for your engagement. And I don't know if you've ever heard anything quite like that from the University of Wisconsin system in terms of the unifying um, theme that water brings to this uh, system. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I'll offer a few summary comments and then give you an update in terms of where we're at with some of the discussions around legislative and government uh, funding for the work that we're asking for. Um, before I do that, I just want to give you a real quick example of the importance that brings this together. We recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of Kikoman being in Wisconsin. Every five years there's a major celebration. The chairman spoke about why they're in Wisconsin. And it's really fascinating. He said, we think long term in Japan. We have 50, 100, 200 year planning cycles. They think out that far. They see the future in terms of water shortages as being so fundamental that this is the place they want to be. We're seeing increasingly reports where agriculturally and other areas where people will come back to the Midwest because we're the only place that has the type of water supply. We take for granted oftentimes water issues in the state of Wisconsin because of the quantitude of it. But in fact, if you go to California, Texas, Georgia, Atlanta, where the water costs are more expensive than any other city in the country, um, you don't take it for granted for long. That's in the United States. When you go to the third world and you go to most other countries, water is one of the most important issues um, facing them environmentally. Think about South Africa, which had um, major issues last year in terms of the city, um, many of the major cities not simply having enough uh, water at all. Um, so, so these are the issues of our time. And I don't think there really is anything that, that is, is compelling uh, across our system. In terms of where we're at from a financial perspective and some of the work in front of us, let's start first of all with the UW system. President Cross and prior to that, uh, Vice President Henderson had been major advocates of some of the work that were underlying. And President Cross said, Mark, this is important. And UW-Milwaukee, with some of our history, um, has, has been uh, able to help lead that. And, and we're honored to do so. I want to recognize, of course, Val and Tim's support in conjunction with our Vice Provost, Phyllis King, Eric Leaf, uh, who's an uh, Assistant Dean, and, and um, our Provost has, has been a major uh, leader in terms of, of a lot of the work. And when I say that, we've been at every single campus multiple times. We've had conferences. There's a lot of work behind us. It's tremendous. Um, we are also supported, and we're on the verge of, of potentially additional support from WEDC. Um, and Vincent Rice, uh, one of the sector vice presidents, uh, senior vice presidents, is here with us today, and we appreciate that. Um, with respect to, to where we're at, I think you know the background in terms of some of these particular pieces, but I'll go through a structure really quick. Um, because of the timing and how long we've been working on this, um, we didn't get early into the budget cycle. But um, where we're at today is that um, we've visited with the governor, we visited with a number of legislators, and um, our UW system administration has been giving us permission to, to explore the funding still in this current budget cycle. So we have briefed the governor. We've met with Secretary Cole from the DNR, uh, DOA, uh, Secretary Joel Brennan. We've met with a number of legislative leaders um, throughout this. The JFC chair, Senator Alberta Darling, has said, um, quote, this initiative was too good, unquote, to wait until the next budget cycle. And she's talked about being the co-sponsor of a bill that would help uh, put this in the budget. She has encouraged us to share the plan with other legislators. Um, and she's back now. She had been out for a while. And she's been out helping with support. So just as we finalized this plan, as we pulled a lot of the pieces together, and I don't know, Val, if it's ever really final. I think this is uh, continuing to evolve. Governor Evers declared this is the year of clean water. Right about the same time, Assembly Speaker Voss 
uh, appointed a bipartisan task force on clean water, and they began holding a series of meetings around the state. The timing of that bipartisan issue, um, or bipartisan efforts around the water issue, actually coincided perfectly with what we are trying to roll out and what you're hearing today. So um, Todd Novak, he's the uh, co-chair of Speaker Voss's task force. He's invited faculty from many of the folks that you've heard today to speak as that tour goes around the state. And I think there's nine locations that they'll be at or have been at, and we have faculty at every one of those. So we're speaking um, to this task force. And it really is repeating the kinds of things that you've heard here, how we will contribute and the types of things that we'll do to address water challenges in Wisconsin. Later in July, that task force is going to receive an in-depth briefing on the program. As you can appreciate, timing is a bit of a challenge because that group is operating a little behind the budget cycle. That said, the budget cycle may elongate, and we may be in perfect timing to, to work with the budget. We won't know until uh, later uh, in the summer. Next steps. Um, we're uh, continuing to brief legislators on what we're doing on the real issues. We've got many champions of this. Um, we want to assist companies, we want to assist communities, ag, many, many sectors to prepare the next generation of talent, but also to help solve uh, the types of issues that are there. Um, so the big goal right now is to continue to build that legislative support. So we're happy to answer any questions, get any of your perspectives, and certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, share what we're doing in Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin. Thank you, gentlemen. Regent Thank you very much, Mark and Val. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Val, to cross paths with you in the water space. Um, in my day job, I, I, uh, I run a regional financial institution in the northern part of the state, and some years back, six or seven years back, I really became appalled at the misuse and misunderstanding of how to use uh, our, water, our water resources. And um, I'm getting to a couple of points in this regard, but effectively what we did was we've turned what should be one of our greatest social and economic assets into a problem. And my thesis is that we've done that through a profound misunderstanding or absence of understanding about how to handle the economics of a scarce resource. And I notice there are some economists sort of involved in this, but from an academic point of view and from every other point of view, we're approaching this water thing uh, through primarily the natural sciences and environmental biology. And, and I really think, uh, I totally applaud the effort. Um, I would love to see you accelerate. It's of, it's of extreme importance because we have to get back to seeing this as an opportunity, not a problem. We, we can't call this the, the, the new oil and then come at it from the standpoint of, of, of dealing with yesterday's problems. Um, Water is, by definition, a public good, meaning it, it can't be owned privately, as every regular beer drinker knows. Um, you, can't, you can't own it. And the misuse of water is an external social cost, which economists have a lot to say about how to change behavior through changing our thinking about this. So we, when I've observed, you know, Two, two things. One is it's still like the Old West when they would fight over the wells. When you start talking about water and you really start to say the things that need to be said, you're going to tick some people off. And, and, and you know, so if we're going to be effective, we need, to, we, need to, we need to realize that. I think we need a much heavier dose of economics involved in this as opposed to simply approaching it through the natural sciences because there's a presum presumption that sound economics and sound environmental policy are necessarily in opposition, and they're not necessarily in opposition. So um, we've, we've got this situation where we've clever, cleverly turned our greatest asset into a problem. It's not the first time we've done it, and I, I really applaud your efforts. Let's make it into an opportunity, and it's not about trying to punish the urban sector, the agricultural sector. It's about trying to find real solutions. and. Um, so for, for crying out loud, can we get some economists, actually, 
uh, in, involved in, in this at a more robust level as well. So, I, think, thank you. I think your comments are well put. I know Val has a comment. I'll make a quick comment. You know, Fortune magazine probably four years ago had an article that underscored exactly your point. They had essentially a centerfold and it had like all these five gallon bottles of water and it had like the number 654 at the bottom. And you're like, what are these water, you know, it had a picture of a cheeseburger, 654 and all these five gallon bottles. <laughs> And it pointed out that it took 654 gallons of water to make a single McDonald's cheeseburger. And you have to work backwards to think through the whole system in terms of how do they get there, raising the cow, growing the grass. How do you, you know, think about a, gal a, a square of cheese takes like eight gallons of water. It's, it's crazy when you back up and you look at the economics of water. The power of our, and, and by the way, the thousands of gallons for a ton of steel, and the point of that article was this is a bipartisan, this, this should bring people together from all different areas. And I think what the UW system is doing, you saw at Whitewater, for example, in their business school, they're involved. You've got different pockets at Madison where you've got economists, you've got people, but we need to elevate, we, we need to really find the right balance on this and, and portray it. I, I really love the positive approach you're bringing in terms of the positive direction. There's many opportunities here. Let's be known as the leader in helping solve those issues, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with your uh, getting more economists involved. In fact, is uh, despite you know reductions in faculty, Mark talked about, we approached a private foundation here locally and asked them if they would be willing to support a position in our water policy center for an applied economist. And I'm happy to report that you know on August 1st we'll hire a fellow who is currently working at EPA in Cincinnati who is an expert in um, valuing water systems and, and uh, applied economics around water. So I couldn't agree more. Uh, this, is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Regent Mueller. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I, was, I really want to applaud the collaboration that we heard about this afternoon. I was thinking of that old saying, a rising tide lifts all boats, and it seems to me you have a Wisconsin ID interpretation of this, that a rising tide will help all of our campuses. So kudos to you. I do also, another one final comment. I would emphasize the urgency of the issue. The UW-Madison Go Big Read book this year was called The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. And if you haven't had an opportunity to read that book to my colleagues, I encourage you to do so, because our Great Lakes are at great risk. That's the takeaway from that book. So again, kudos to you. I hope we can come up with the funding to initiate this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Bechtel. Uh, I want to echo the uh, compliments, uh, and I think we all will feel that way as regents. This is very exciting. Um, I'm almost sorry you had to present after lunch because there should be a lot of energy and excitement around this. This is a fantastic opportunity. I love your comment about an unfair competitive advantage. We do own that. I have a high sense of urgency as well in terms of the world knows that there is this issue and we need to take advantage of the position we have, the intellectual power and might and the industry that we already have in this state. So there's so many assets here, it's, we're just spoiled with riches. So just two comments. I agree on the business focus and what I'm seeing in industry, whether it's agribusiness, manufacturing, um, you know, people that make this. And, and Mark, you and I know this in some of the st discussions we've had at the Water Council. There is going to be more of a, an applied economics model to this because the world recognizes the scarcity of the resource and how we do need to protect it uh, for future generations and for literally our survival. So um, I, I came away with, this, with that same kind of sense of where's the, econ the economic perspective and how do we take this pipeline and drive it right into businesses because they're, sorry for the pun, thirsty uh, for this kind of knowledge and this kind of applied uh, learning. And the second point is, you know, we talk about migration of talent out of the state. This is a perfect example of the inflow of talent and young people uh, and our ability to educate folks within the system and then have them stick to Wisconsin. Uh, again, I represent a lot of employers and we all have difficulty getting people to the state and then we have difficulty getting them out of the state because once people are here, they love Wisconsin, our lifestyle, our standard of living and everything else. So 
whether uh, one slide did make the point, which I think was excellent, that we can be a magnet nationally, but I would ask you to think too about internationally because the criticality around this issue is probably more critical and more, um, there's more exposure and recognition of the problem internationally. Think about the Middle East, think about Asia, think about some of those other places. And I, for one, am certainly willing to educate international students. Some will stay, some will take this knowledge and go back and help their own cultures and, and countries. And that's something we should be proud of in Wisconsin. So I just kind of think about that international piece as well. Uh, as we try to create this magnet uh, of uh, talent to the state. Great, thank you. Other comments? Regent Klein. Um, yes, great presentation, um, and I'm just so happy this is coming together. Um, watching, I think I was on an early phone call, and um, it's just a natural for us, and the fact that you're doing this and bringing all these different campuses together, it's precisely the kind of new initiative that we, we really love to see. I guess one question was, you know, when I look at the pink sheet that kind of describes this, um, it says request, requested action, information only. Um, and I wondered, do you, you know, would it be helpful to you in your, maybe it's a moonshot right now for this legislative session, uh, but would it be helpful to you if you had a vote of support or, or approval of this and a, a endorsement of some sort from this body? I, I think it would be. I think that type of endorsement would carry a lot of Water, RR. I'm sorry, this, this, <laughs> this, this uh, subject leads itself to a lot of puns, and I hope I'm not all wet. Um, but, but, sorry, sorry, um, turn the faucet off on these. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I think that would be important, and I think the other aspect that we'd ask for as we go around these listening sessions is to actually ask for your accompaniment if that would be possible and we'd work with your schedules to join us because these will be um, for the, the um, Speaker Voss's task force around the state um, on this particular issue. So I think both of those would be very beneficial. A absolutely. We're just sidebarring here on what we can do. We haven't, we haven't uh, um, uh, message this and so for us to do something today would be tricky there are a couple of options we could have certainly President Cross and myself could send a letter to the legislature rapidly uh, to get that front and center um, I think it's you know great comments about pumping the brakes and let's being economically rational about this but when you think about the clusters that we try to manifest in regions of the state I have not seen anything like this that touches every single campus and really exploits in the best possible way all of the things that we have capabilities to do, even on campuses that are not water rich, right? So that's certainly something we could do. We could also memorialize this for certain at the July meeting. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think we would all be very much open to this. When you think about making wise investment in high impact practices that build capacity, this is really the flagship uh, argument that touches every part of the state, and so I would put that back as a response, Regent Klein, and, and seek your seek your thoughts. Well, um, uh, yes, thank you, Vice Chairman Peterson. I guess the question I had is, could we just do a simple motion that just says we endorse and support um, this initiative, and that we um, urge the legislature to allocate funds in the 1921 budget? So we could do it as an it as a non-binding uh, vote, uh, and we can follow oh, up. because it's not on the agenda, is it's it? It's not on the agenda. I got we you. Yep, okay. We haven't messed right. So, Ray, when, when, when you're not getting what you want, sometimes the guy needs to ask for more. <laughs> <laughs> I like your <laughs> So, what, what, what is your preference? I think we're wholly supportive in exceeding this as a friendly amendment. Process away from, you know, what the staff has put together, but I, I would just, if it's, I would make the motion that we, the Board of Regents, um, uh, recommend that the legislature uh, fund the freshwater, what is it, the freshwater collaboration initiative um, in the 1921 biennial budget. Question. Region What's the price tag? Well, it is, let me see here, it's, it's 20, <coughs> is it 21 or 20? It'd be uh, 10.7 million in the base budget. 
this biennial budget. Right. For the 1921 is what I, I read. And there are metrics that they've put in the pink report that probably could even be, or probably um, uh, not aspirational. I think you could probably beat those. I don't know. Well, as, as, as long as we recognize as a board that this is non-binding, um, I, I think we can we can certainly take take this vote if we have a second. Do we have a second, second. to that motion? Second. Second from Regent Atwell. Any discussion? I have a question. Um, we do have <coughs> issues with the legislature. We're asking for some funding, and they have turned down. Does this conflict with what we're asking? I think Regent Atwell put it well, where this is something that we have put forward previously. Uh, Chancellor Mone has documented the conversations that are taking place. I think this amplifies the support of the UW System Board of Regents that we think this is a worthwhile endeavor. I don't think it's in conflict with our operating or capital budget requests. I think it's um, complementary with an E to, you know, to that. Um, and so uh, that would be my, my, my response, uh, Regent Delgado. Yes. Yep. President Cross. So a piece of the um, capacity building portion that's in our budget um, dealt with this. So it wasn't the full 10 uh, whatever million, but for this budget, but a piece of it was in there. So yeah. we, we, we could, uh, Tracy, we could incorporate it in, into your motion or into our motion, um, a reference to the fact that we don't intend this to the exclusion of other priorities previously expressed. Is that okay? Is that okay with the author? Oh, that's fine with me. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table to uh, to express the support of the Board of Regents in favor of this uh, specific uh, proposal. Uh, and I think that that jives with what we've previously done as it relates to our operating and capital requests. With that, any other discussion? S Regent Bechtel? Yeah, just I think, it, I think it expresses the purpose of urgency, which I fully support. And I would note for the record that our esteemed president has two shins. <laughs> 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 President Cross? I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, so we will write a letter to this effect to legislators um, in response to this um, non-binding resolution. All right, with that, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Uh, have we no uh, additional questions? Just Regent one, one, one quick comment. I don't want to repeat everything that's been said, but I requested this presentation, so I <laughs> completely support what you're doing. I would like to request uh, from uh, the board vice president that we periodically get posted on the progress being made in the freshwater front. Not necessarily in this exact same format, but just that we keep it top of mind. Yeah, I completely support that. I mean, given the opportunities that have been brought to us today, and, and certainly Dean Val, thank you for managing the entire panel. Very gracious of you to do that. But it was important for us to hear that this is, at its heart, a, cl a cluster and collaborative opportunity that's um, really second to none. I mean, we'd love to, to uncover three more of these to really set Wisconsin apart, but we should not stand in the way of progress for this one. So again, to the panelists and to uh, our, our chancellors and provosts, thank you very much uh, for your input. So that wraps up our Thursday open session business, and I have the uh, I have the good fortune to continue to bring us into closed session today, this afternoon. And so I'd ask all board members to stay in place while we complete the roll call to move into closed session, and then the regents will relocate to the fireside lounge on the first floor. So with that, I move that the Board of Regents move into closed session to A, consider a student request for review of a UW-Madison disciplinary decision as permitted by Section 19851A, F, and G. B, to consider personnel evaluations of chancellors as permitted by Section 19851C. And C, to confer with legal counsel regarding pending litigation, AR versus Board of Regents, Fabricini versus Pierce et al., and potential litigation as permitted by Section 19851A.